We've only got a couple of people. Away. I will start with the karakia. E oha ki runga ki aranganui, e oha ki raro ki a papa tuanuku, turakina na mia ki no ki te pai atia, uia mai o korowe aroha, he tonga mamato, kaputa ki te wai o ki te, ki te au marama, homie, huie, tai kie. I acknowledge, greet those things above, the sky, universe, and the heavens. I acknowledge, greet those things below, the earth, in all its entirety. Cast all negativity to the distant horizons. Cover us with the cloak of affection and love as a treasure bestowed upon us so we may enter into enlightenment. Let it be bound and fixed. Yes, fixed. Let it be agreed by all. Amen. Wonderful. Um, we have one apology. Um, Do you want the karakia, Madam Chair? Oh, the, the uh, sorry, Edith. My apologies. Thank you for the reminder. We are now going to um, stand and sing our waiata. Led, led by our three leading ladies. Wonderful, thank you. And I always have trouble with that final high last note. <laughs> so um, back, to, back to the apologies. We have one apology from Councillor Philippa. She may be able to make it a bit later, but she's, she's not sure, but she apologises anyway. Can I have a mover for that? Kate, thank you. Josh, thank you. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Um, declarations of interest. Any of those? None? Wonderful, thank you. So our first big... Um, Excuse me, Madam Chair, we have some additional information oh. for item... Well, not additional, yeah, it is for item 5.10. Okay, so Jeff, for... Pass around at that time. Okay, so we have an additional item at 5.10 and we'll, we'll distribute that at the time. Otherwise, I now invite our... Oh, we need to move it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mover, I'll move. Kate will second. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. So if it's not listed on the, on the run sheet, I won't see it. So um, now, Vivek, we now invite you to, to come up and sit at our, our presenter's table. A very big welcome to you, Vivek. Vivek Bangia is the um, the owner and operator of the of the um, Four Square and Castle Club, and a really big thank you to you, Vivek, for all the wonderful things that you do out there in our community. You, you're going to have about ten minutes. You can talk for the full ten if you like, or <laughs> I, yeah, or you can leave some time for questions. So I'm going to hand over to you. Sure. First of all, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come and present the case. Uh, I shouldn't say the word case, but basically, I'm looking for some resolution from you guys and like I was reading on the screen before the meeting it said something like make it happen so I believe uh, I'll get a answer from you guys at some stage and you'll make it happen okay uh, the problem we have is we have a, a beautiful tree outside our shop um, a Putokawa tree uh, for years uh, we have maintained it but it's reached a stage where it is causing a lot of damage, not only to the building and the infrastructure of the building, but to the roadside uh, 
uh, the road, the car parking, it has become a health and safety risk, whereby a lot of the kids, uh, you'll see a lot of photographs in there where the kids have tried to climb up and the tree has broken down. It's not in a, a real healthy state, I should say. Uh, the roading and uh, especially the drainage in front of it is continuously blocked. It's costed me a few thousand dollars over the years and it's the cost is just going up and up. I have been to the council for last four years to find a solution to it. Uh, apparently they can't decide whether the tree belongs to the council or to the roading works. So we never reach anywhere And, uh, and I had approached Councillor Jenny a few years back as well, and she tried helping me writing a letter to the council to try and find a solution to it, but apparently with, again, no success. I guess it's too hard a basket, and everybody wants to just push it on the side. Uh, but it has now reached a stage where, um, as a business, it has become my health and safety issue because it's right in my area of domain but I can't do anything and you guys need to take a decision because I have customers falling on the road. I have ladies who have hurt themselves and uh, before it becomes a major big problem, I guess we need some solution from you guys. I'm not against the tree as such. I'm happy if you want to put another tree. We would love to take care of it. We took care of it. This one for so many years, it's nothing against the tree. It's just the kind of tree it is and the damage it's putting up, it's costing a huge amount of money. I mean, and at the council front, uh, uh, you know, where the pipe breaks, they will pay you if the pipe breaks in the front and not at the back. And on some technicality or the other, they would try and avoid paying the bill. And uh, I understand uh, it's a child, and over the years I have footed the bill, but it's come to a stage whereby Financially, it is not viable for me to keep footing the bill and, um, you know, not being able to get a resolution from you guys. Everybody has taught me how to kill the tree, but nobody is telling me how to, you know, maintain and sort it out. And uh, I don't want to go that route. For four years, I've tried my best to approach the council in every shape or form to try and get a resolution. Finally, I have to come in front of you guys and request you guys to please give me some decision and some way of going forward so that it does not become a health and safety risk. If it becomes, then you guys got to be equally liable with me. I'm not going to take the full responsibility of it. So at some stage, we need it. Yes, uh, the pipes now have come to such a stage that a lot of sand is going out into the drain. And according to the plumbers and the rest of the guys, the building at some stage will start to see its effect and start becoming unstable because all the sand is being washed off under the building into the drain. And, uh, you know, and it will become a very big cost, whether for you or for me or whosoever. End of the day, I just need some answers from you guys and some guidance uh, to going forward. I mean... Yeah, everything, either it's sinking or it's lifting up. And for last so many years, and with so many complaints, not even once has anybody come, looked at it, done anything from the council. The moment you tell them the name of the tree, everybody just walks away. And uh, But unfortunately, or fortunately, I need some answers. It's come to a stage whereby, you know, I'm more than happy if another tree is put up or anything uh, else is put up, which we all can maintain and have a good looking tree over there, but something that can be done. And if you guys have any questions, please go for it. It's got a technical glitch here and that we're set up to for me to click, but it's not set up on here. No, no, the, um, the, the, I can't transfer people over to talk. Yeah. Quick, quick, quick meeting, no talking. <laughs>
in the meantime, <coughs> did they, <coughs> um, have, how, how many people have? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll park that question, and I'm going cool. to go back to, to people. Thank you very much, Diane. Yeah, yeah. And Josh, over to you. Thank you, Vivek, and I um, appreciate the presentation and um, you know, I understand how, how frustrating it must be for you now. Um, my, my question's just um, one of clarification. You mentioned at the, uh, at the start of your presentation that there was uh, a lack of taking ownership from council and there was another party. Who, uh, who was uh, that? Roding, uh, I mean, because the tree is right, you know, where the car park is. Yeah. So when I first approached the council and said, look, who's going to be responsible for it. And they said they can't see the tree on their plan or chart. Mm. It could be a tree that is the roadings, uh, the, you know, the roading department or whatever. Okay. They would right. have put the tree. And I said, look, uh, so they said to me that they have approached them for an answer. And uh, we never got an answer from them. But speaking to a lady uh, about a month or so back, she did say that it comes on, uh, because it's on council reserve land, so it should be a council's mm. tree. Okay. So last month I did get that clarification from her that because it's on the council reserve, and uh, so it, I, my guess is that it should be council's. Cool. Uh, okay, and, and my second question, um, I imagine it's not as simple as just trimming it then because it's you're talking about it impacting the underground infrastructure as well and the paving. I mean, trimming so. part, we have looked after it. Yeah. You know, if you look at, uh, if I can go back, if you look at the tree, you know, we have tried to trim it so that the lower end of the branches are not there mm. because they were scratching the top of the cars. And so we have, you know, over the years cut those trees up. Mm. But, uh, you know, uh, there's some stages where the kids have tried to climb them up the tree when parents are shopping and uh, you know you can see on the photograph at the bottom they've gone there and pulled the tree and the whole branch has broken off mm -hmm. and then you're looking after the kids as to you know once they're off the thing and uh, you know it's i mean look the tree is there but it's wouldn't say it's in a very very healthy state as well i mean uh, and the roots are the major major issue yeah it's uh, yeah. Thank you, that's all from me. Well, <coughs> Councillor Ross. Oh, sorry. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> thank you. I, I am a local and I shop at your store and I do not park anywhere near that tree. Um, my question to you though is, um, you stated earlier that this has been going on for about four years and from your recall, not once has, if I heard you correctly, not once has someone from council come and stood by that tree and had, the, had that discussion with you. No, sir. Is that, is that what you said? That's right, sir. Thank you. Councillor Charlotte. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to know what your preferred outcome would be. Would it, would it be for council to remove the tree and put something else there in its place? Uh, yes, um, I would prefer to still have a tree out there if I can. Uh, I have a vested interest in that. It saves me from ram raiding. <laughs> uh, <coughs> but uh, um, look, I'm being honest there. It does that purpose for me. Uh, but uh, look, I would like something to be put there which can be managed. Mm. I would rather make it beautiful, put some seating around there for people to sit or, you mm -hmm. know, something which can do a dual purpose job. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment, the boundary which is uh, around the tree is breaking off at every corner. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it doesn't belong to me, I can't touch it or do anything. I'd rather, you know, have a good tree which can be managed and make us something more presentable for people to sit or tie their dogs or some watering mm. plant. I mean, something which we yeah. can use it yeah, in yeah. a much better way would be ideal for us. Um, yeah, my, my second question. Um, so I have had trouble with Pahutakawa roots myself. Um, and in my situation, it just completely filled 
um, drains blocked them and split them. Is that what's happening for you? And is that where the main cost has been for you in, uh, in drain yes. replacement? Yes. Uh, I mean, that's an ongoing cost. At least three, four times a year costs me about 500 to $600 every time. The plumbers have to come in and, you know, clear all the roots mm -hmm. through the drain. But the thing is, that's one part of it. Now the pipe is being broken, and the thing is, this the only solution I have is ballooning the pipe to try and, you know, keep it safe. Mm. But till the time this tree is there, that thing is also not possible because it will continue to break whatever we do. Yeah. And uh, because of the lot of sand that's going on from the bottom, uh, before it becomes a total where the building is unstable or that part of it, mm. uh, you know, we like to have some solution for the tree so we can repair it and, and give it a little longer life. Mm. In that thank area. you. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vivek. Mm. Really yeah. appreciate your presentation here today. Um, I have a question of the Chief Executive. <laughs> is that all right to ask? Yes. So my question is how um, is the best way to resolve this issue in his view? please, or get some resolution in this issue, and I'm looking more for a process rather than a definitive answer. <coughs> so process-wise, because this is the, the first time hearing of this one, I'm going to go and talk to my management team, both the roading and the parks team, just try and get to the bottom of whether this is or isn't council land and, and our tree. If it is, we'll Make it see happen. what work is needed. Thank you. Councillor Charlie. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've established that the tree is actually on council reserve, is that correct? Uh, that is what I was told last month, sir. So the drains that are being blocked, are they your drains or council drains? So <coughs> my drains, but they, the roots block the, where the main, uh, uh, how should I say, if I sh you see the right outside the sun, this thing? Right. And that's where it gets blocked. And uh, because it gets, and when we open that lid and we clear this thing, the drains work. Right. But it is always on the side that it's So is it correct to assume that there's a council tree yeah. blocking your drain? That's right. Or breaking my drains and, but if the roots are coming at this side, yep. the council takes responsibility. <laughs> if the roots don't show up, they don't want to take the responsibility, it becomes my problem. Thank you. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to suggest a recommendation that we might um, thank Mr. Bangia for his presentation today and uh, leave it to the Chief Executive to follow up. I'd be more than happy to accept that and to second it. Um, um, oh, it's Charlotte. Oh, you, I. Oh, you, you can second. I'll. I'll. It's all good. Okay. We're going to thank, <clears throat> also add to that, we're going to thank Mr. Bangia for his his presentation and recommend that the CEO and, leave, and, yeah, and the CEO leave it in the CEO's hands, so however you want to put that. I guess that's fine. Hmm? Well, I think this is not earth shattering, so I think we should know by the next meeting, which is in six weeks' time. That's, that's reasonable, isn't it? Oh, that's no. I'm already working. Who knows? It may be resolved, Vivek, by the time you get back to, no, to your business. <laughs> It is a beautiful tree. Oh, yes. Um, as pahutakawas, mature pahutakawas are, they're beautiful trees, but their roots also um, are very much embedded in people's drains and in case law. So, um, okay, so that's all being put to it. We've got a mover and a seconder, Kate and Charlotte, and all those in favour, against, carried. Thank you very much, Vivek. Thank we you. really appreciate you coming Thank in here and presenting so well. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and hope to have some good results soon. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you.
Now back to process. Um, item 4.1, minutes of the Operations and Performance Committee of the 18th of May. Are there any suggested amendments or concerns about those minutes? Yay, nay. Happy, Josh was happy to move. Peter's happy to second. You're not. Mm. Glenda, thank you. Um, anyone with any questions? Yes. Councillor Peter. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. This is more just a clarification for me. I have not had the time to read the minutes. Can I abstain or so I don't know whether they're true or accurate because I haven't read them. So I feel uncomfortable voting that they are true and correct when I actually haven't checked. Um, that's entirely up to you. The minutes aren't um, narrative minutes. They're just um, what the item was, who voted, uh, um, who moved and seconded the motion and that it was carried. Um, and, and that's the, the, the basis of it, what the recommendation is. So it, I'm, I'm going to leave it entirely over to you to make that decision. Um, I, I must confess, I don't always read the minutes because now that they're not narrative, um, all the details not there. We have to go back to the live stream. So there you go. But it's a very good question. So thank you for asking it. Um, all those in favour? Against? And I'll abstain, thank you. Okay. And Pete's abstaining, um, carried. Thank you. Thank you for that. We are now moving to 5.1. And I'd like to invite Damien and Sarah. A bit of a squeeze down that end of the table. <clears throat> Over to you guys to you. present um, this item. I just wanted to introduce um, Damien Wood to you all. Some of you will know Damien um, from his previous role at Council as the development engineer. He um, flew the nest last year um, and has come back this year. Um, as the transportation manager picking up the operational uh, uh, portfolio of roading, active transport, the port operations um, and the airport um, operations. Um, so I think he is known to most of you but not, not all of you. Um, so consequently today we've got a little bit of pent up demand because um, we've had a, a gap in the, um, in the role for a few months um, so that's why there's four papers today. Um, so I'll hand it over to um, Damien to take you through the detail. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And um, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to present these um, papers this morning, specifically this first paper, um, the um, Bridge 15 replacement project. Um, so I'll take the paper as read and I just want to highlight a few key points. Um, so the construction industry in general has been subject to some pretty significant cost um, fluctuations in materials and labour, and this has pretty much impacted upon our ability to deliver all of our capital works projects within the coming um, financial year. So it's 23-24 financial year. Um, therefore, as a result of that, we've had to prioritise the projects and um, present to you today our options for advancing the um, critical projects, and specifically for this paper, the Bridge 15 replacement. Um, our recommendation that we present to you today is informed um, by independent professional advice and consideration of Council's policies and objectives. Um, the recommendation seeks to transfer funds from the um, Wakefield Street Bridge replacement project, that's Bridge 74, to the Bridge 15 replacement project, which is um, Ernie's Bridge. Um, we've engaged with Waka Kotahi, um, NZTA, as um, our major funding partner on this one, and they've indicated their support for the um, preferred option that we make a recommendation for today. Um, the recommendation we present to you um, best utilises the Waka Kotahi NZTA funding that um, Council has available to it. Um, based on the current project valuation advice, we believe that there's still sufficient funds retained in the Bridge 74 project to complete the detailed design within the current, or sorry, within the 23-24 financial year. 
Um, the Bridge 74 replacement project itself is still an essential infrastructure project and we're not seeking to dispel it altogether. We, we will be including it in the next um, LTP and within the next Waka Kotahi low cost, low risk funding application that we'll be lodging this year. Uh, the recommendation allows Council to complete the Bridge 15 replacement within the 23-24 financial year um, with no unbudgeted funding um, required. Um, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you Damien and welcome back. Good to see you and in that role. Over to you Councillor Josh. Thanks Damien. Just a question around the gap in between the detailed design period for or work that will be done for Bridge 74 and when the funding becomes available. So presumably there's no risk of the design needs changing in between that period um, before NZTA grants the additional funding if we do approve this recommendation? That's correct. Okay. Um, the work, it seeks to advance the detailed design. The um, co-partner or fun, uh, design approval partner for this project, for um, Bridge 74, will be Kiwi Rail. So once we've got that design locked in with Kiwi Rail as part of the detailed design, it's pretty much locked in and cemented in. Are there, so, so Waka Kotahi administers their funding through the, the, the FAR rate, don't they, the funding assistance rate. Is there a separate process or a more complex process for Kiwi Rail administered funding? So Kiwi Rail won't fund it. Um, Kiwi Rail provide design approval. I see, okay. Um, and that, that process for anyone that's been engaged with it is a, a pretty robust sort of process. It's, it can be quite time consuming and I'll be presenting a paper shortly about a project that does have Kiwi Rail involvement and I'll be able to fill you in on that time. But it is a robust process that we have to go through. Um, so it, it provides a very high quality detailed design. Perfect, thank you. Councillor Charlie. Thanks Damien. You've probably made it clear but so all we're doing really is just deferring Bridge 74 a bit longer. It's not, not as if it's going to be closed at any time soon. It'll just be deferred before it's replaced. That's correct. Cool. Thanks. Councillor Rob. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> bridge 74 is a bit hard to identify, but you did say Wakefield Street Bridge, didn't you? Okay. Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, <sighs> You would be aware, Damien, and first of all, welcome back. Good choice for both yourself and the council. But um, the um, Wakefield Bridge on the annual plan about five years ago <coughs> was the big issue, and it was to be closed, and it was unsafe, and it was to become a pedestrian-only bridge. It seems to me now... We've moved away from that and saying that it's not urgent anymore. Can you comment of why that urgency is not there for the Wakefield Street Bridge? I would clarify the urgency is still there for Wakefield Street Bridge. It is just a simple fact that Ernie's Bridge is more urgent, more urgent. than Wakefield Street Bridge. We, I do not seek to... Um, change that urgency for Wakefield Street Bridge. I'm simply saying that based on the advice we've got and the impact on the community, um, Ernest Bridge is of a higher priority. Okay, so with... if this goes back into the process again, this Wakefield Street Bridge, is it facing closure to the public? The advice that we've had from our bridge inspections is that that's not immediately imminent. Okay, so it's closed to heavy vehicles at the moment? Yep. And it'll stay open for vehicles that aren't heavy? That's the position at this point in time, yes. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Peter. Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <coughs> the Ernie's Bridge, can you confirm that that's the one just opposite Kemp's Pole? <coughs> I 
believe I believe it is. Yeah, it, I believe it's, yeah, it's, um, it's got but, a big yeah. culvert in it at the moment. <coughs> no, that the one with the big culvert in it is um, is just a culvert. The um, Ernest Bridge is nine kilometres past the culvert that we've got the temporary um, container bridge or container culvert in. So it's nine kilometres past there. It's uh, it's further up the road. It's on a sharp. There's some images in the report. It's on a sharp bend, and it's the pinch point for the logging industry at the moment. There is weight restrictions on Ernie's Bridge at the moment that limits their logs. They actually stockpile logs on the other side of the bridge at the moment, carry them across, and then reload them. Okay. Um, yes, I have read your report fully. <laughs> the um, my concern then is with the risk of um, Wakako Tahi. If you transfer, what are, well, if you transfer those funds now, what are the, is there a risk that they won't approve um, funding for Bridge 74? There is always that risk that exists, um, but the discussions that we've had with Waka Kotahi have been favourable to our future application within low cost, low risk budget for that work. The fact that we're able to advance the detailed design further supports that case that it is simply a, to coin a term from our COVID era, um, shovel ready. Mm. Okay, no, thank you. Councillor Kay. Thank you. Thanks, lovely to have you back and um, even more love the fact that you two are colour coordinated, so well done, thank you. Um, and loving your reports that I've got up to numbered 101, although that's surpassed to 103 bulleted number points um, in your reports, but very concise, so thank you for that. Um, my question is really just about if we push go now, and I'm, I guess this is not a um, uh, um, go or not go, um, it's more a question around um, the ability to deliver it in the 23-24 financial year. You know, we know about um, contracts being let for bridges on the east coast and there's a lot of lot happening in this sector at the moment. Is, is it likely that Ernie's bridge will be completed in the 23-24 year? For most certainly. Um, we're, we're well advanced in our, in our process already with this. Um, we've got some contractors ready to do the last of the geotechnical work upon a favourable outcome of this meeting um, that we can engage almost immediately. Uh, we've got the project time frame set to have it tendered um, before the construction season starts this year and testing the market around um, availability. Um, local contractors have indicated that they're, they're, they're definitely interested in it. Um, I can attest we've a little bit further advanced with work on the, the next paper that I'm about to present and the level of interest through a registration. Uh, we've recently released a registration of interest for, for another bridging project and the interest from the industry has been very good, very good. Excellent. And in terms of the forestry um, industry, they'll be able to work, what this bridge would be closed, how would that be managed through that process, Ernie's Bridge? We're working with the forestry industry on that matter um, and our discussions with the forestry industry are kind of influenced by the decision that's made today um, because it gives us a clear um, time frame for when things are going to happen and we can actually engage with those stakeholders and residents and that sort of stuff. There is a, as with any project, the, the communication um, with the stakeholders for this for, for this project particularly is going to be really important because there, there could be an effect on them and so it's articulating that early and working with them to... Um, to deal with any issues that are there. Thank you, and my, just my last question, and it's implied in the report that um, Bridge 74 has no issues in terms of declining safety, um, given that it's gonna to have to wait a bit longer. Yeah, as I said previously, it's, it's still an, an essential project, um, critical. Um, the, the advice that we've received is that in it, the controls that we've got in place there are suitable for it at this point in time. Right. Thank you very much. Lovely. Can I have you step a mover? Hey, in a seconder, Charlie. Thank you very much. Um, any comments?
Oh. Um, I can't. Oh, you as you have got my mic, I think. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're me. Off you go. Oh. Uh, so I, I think it, I, it was just covered in the last uh, last question there from Councillor Kate in regard to uh, the safety of uh, Bridge 74. So um, my my question is really um, I, I think hopefully covered. But uh, given uh, because new councillors or new newly elected members are probably we're, we're a bit fresh to this, but I think Wakefield Bridge has got a long history of uh, of of, uh, of issues, and so. Um, I just, uh, I guess my question is, you are satisfied, Damien, that Bridge 74 is going to be safe uh, from now until its construction starts? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Good. Councillor Rob. Yeah. Yes, I, I just wanted to comment on, first of all, I um, certainly trust the judgment of Damien and would certainly be voting in favour of a preferred option. But I did just wanted to, to, to highlight that those, I don't know whether there's any other councillors that attended the meeting at the Wanganoo East Club a few years back when the big issue was the closure of that Wakefield Street Bridge. It was a pretty fiery meeting, I can tell you that. Now, the reason, of course, was that Waka Kotahi weren't um, going to make funding available for the replacement of that bridge, and that the recommendation was that it closes. Waka Kotahi seems to have had a change of attitude to that bridge, and it's welcome. I would not like to think that they reverted to their earlier um, uh, opinion or just uh, uh, decision where they said, well, sorry, there's no longer any funding available for Walker, for a Wakefield Street Bridge. I just raised that caution. I don't know whether that is a, a fact or whether that's something you're considering, but given the attitude of Walker Kotahi in the past to the Wakefield Street Bridge, it is, would be unsurprising if they readopted it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my my final comment is I, I take heart from the fact that Hoka Kotahi Kotahi have um, allowed the maintaining of funding for the design of the work around the Wakefield Street Bridge, Bridge 74, and therefore still have an intention. So I'm thinking that that's helping to lock in. Um, that process, because I would not want to go back and have to relitigate that that we re that we went through a number of years ago, because it was seriously contentious and extremely time-consuming. So, on that basis, um, all those in favour, against, carried. Thank you. And I'm sure you're going to be stuck in that seat for a moment, Damien and Sarah. Um, Five point two, Aramahu pedestrian bridge replacement project update. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you again all for the opportunity to present the, um, this paper. Um, as last time, I'll take the paper as read and I'd just like to highlight a few of the key points. So again, this is another project where the um, construction industry, materials, labour plant and the likes, we've suffered some pretty serious um, cost fluctuations and that's impacted on, a, on our ability to deliver this project and the proposed reallocation project in the current financial year. Um, we've, we, we have had to prioritise the projects um, presented within this paper to you today. Um, our options for advancing the critical infrastructure project um, is obviously the Aramo bridge has been given a higher um, rating than the construction of a clip onto the city bridge. Um, our recommendation today has been informed by independent professional advice, consideration of the council policies and objectives, and um, also public feedback. Uh, the recommendation that I present to you today um, seeks approval to transfer funds from the City Bridge Clip-On Project to the Aramo Pedestrian Bridge Replacement Project. Both of these projects are funded under low-cost, low-risk um, Wakwatahi 
fund and both are walking and cycling projects so they are comparable. Um, what Kotahi has indicated again support for the approach here um, given that the two projects are both in the same funding category for walking and cycling. The, um, the recommendation best utilises the Waka Kotahi funding to council so we, we maximise the amount of external funding that we're getting. Um, based on the current valuation for the works at um, the Aramo pedestrian bridge um, we have sufficient funds left over within the City Bridge Clip-On project to actually advance that project to the concept design stage. Now this, this differs from my previous one where we were able to advance the detailed design. In this instance we will only be able to advance to the concept design which will enable us to engage um, with the community, with stakeholders and it will enable us to form a far better position around the value of that project. The, the City Bridge Clip-On project is an important walking cycling project um, that we'll seek to include in the next LTP and we will also be looking at a Waka Kotahi funding application um, for that in the future. We're having a look at which of the Waka Kotahi funding mechanisms might best support that project. Waka Kotahi have indicated a strong interest in walking and cycling projects which is favourable, but they do have a number of funding opportunities that we could potentially tap into there. Some may have a higher fu um, funding assistance rate than what we would get under the low cost, low risk budget, or fund, sorry. Um, the, the recommendation will allow the council to complete the Aramo pedestrian replacement within the 23-24 financial year, so this coming financial year, two days time. Um, and the with no unbudgeted um, funding requests. Um, some of you may have seen or heard about the recent um, social media posts that we did um, regarding visual counts of users on the Aramo pedestrian bridge. Um, and what we've seen there is the majority of public comments are heavily in favour of council getting on with this project and getting it done um, and pre pretty keen to see us provide a facility that's got accessibility to a wider number of users and that's that's just straight from the from the social media post that went out it was it wasn't intended to achieve that purpose it was intended to inform us gathering some data um, but I feel it's obliged to just share that information with you um, so the proposed design of the the bridge is is wider um, and it will allow uh, but names a great number of people and modes of transport um, and we're at the stage of a registration of interest that we've released for this for this project and we've had a high level of interest or high good to high level of interest from the construction community on on delivering the project um, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions thank you Damien councillor Ross uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Damien. I've been following this for eight of my nine years when I came back from Wanganui. Um, this has got to a very exciting point. Two questions. Um, for the benefit of the public who will be viewing this now or later on, um, question one is, could you explain the clip-on project for the city bridge? I don't know if a lot of public know what that means specifically. And the second question is this wider footbridge. Um, I've been asked by the disability, people in the disability sector, will it enable people from particularly East Whanganui using mobility scooters to be able to access this uh, new footbridge? Thank you. Um, to answer the first part of the question, the City Bridge Clip-On um, seeks to enable a wider Basically, it's a clip-on structure, much, much the same as the um, Cobham Bridge mm -hmm. style um, on the motorway bridge, where there was a cycleway walkway attached to the motorway bridge for, for safety reasons. Um, on the city bridge, you'll, you'll see that both, both sides of the bridge are quite narrow in terms of footpaths, so 
those that have used it can see that if you've got a cyclist coming towards you and you're walking, it's quite narrow. If there's mobility scooters coming from both directions, there's, there's con the, it's almost impossible to pass on there at the moment. So the City Bridge clip-on simply adds a clip-on facility to one, either the upstream or downstream side of the bridge um, to enable, again, a greater number of users to, to utilise the facility. Um, and it provides that essential connection between both sides of the river for, for those active transport users. Um, the, the, the project's got some complexity with it with regards to the entry and exit at both sides of the river. It's, um, it, it's difficult, you'll, you'll know at the city bridge side there's, there's walkways down each side and if you try and put a wider pathway on there you're going to eat into those walkways which may have an effect on access so um, hence why we're really keen to advance the concept design stage so we can actually work out what that looks like, consult on what that looks like and and work out what the what the real real cost of delivering that project will be. Um, second question, second question. The ah, yes, the mobility scooters on Aramara Railway Bridge. Uh, yes, it, the the design seeks to enable that that mode of transport to get across there. Most certainly, the width's increased to allow mobility scooters to get backwards and forwards across there. I'm conscious that at the moment, um, some can and some can't. Um, and the um, cycle barriers that are there at the moment inhibit quite a few of those users from using that facility. Yeah, the end goal is to enable all active transport modes to, to use that bridge. Yep. yep. Councillor Charlie. Thank you. Um, who actually owns the bridge? New Zealand Rail, is it? Kiwi Rail, yep. So I, I presume they were going to let us put our clip on on the rail bridge. bridge. So we've already got a, um, a detailed design for this project um, that we've submitted to Kiwi Rail, um, and they are currently going through the review process. Their last feedback was some um, management of uh, corrosion between the clip-on and the existing structure, um, but nothing substantial. They are supportive of the upgrade, and we're working collaboratively with them to, to get that done <coughs> ASAP. What's the status of the bridge itself? Is it there for the long haul or is it going to be replaced sometime in the future? I'm not sure what Kiwi Rail's final position on that is. They've indicated support for us continuing to have the clip-on. Just the question I ask you yeah. is just pretty academic really, the fact they're going to put a, a clip-on and they'll pull the thing down next year and build a new one, I don't know. They haven't signalled that's their intention. Councillor Robb. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd Charlie, Councillor Charlie asked the questions that I was going to ask, so I have to come up with some new ones pretty quick. Um, <laughs> um, but um, w the, the the carriageway on that pedestrian uh, crossing on the on the rail bridge is um, quite seriously damaged, as as the photos identify. There's a lot of discussion in the public of, in fact, whether it's even safe to go across there, given that you can actually see the water in places. Um, can you give a reassurance on the safety of that in the meantime, please? Yeah, the, the information I've received is it's still safe for use. Um, if it wasn't, we would have been in front of you a lot earlier on to um, seek immediate action to, to make sure it was safe. So does this um, uh, upgrade um, include work uh, on the support structure of the, of the um, uh, pedestrian way, or is it just a surface? Um, this is a complete replacement. replacement of the pedestrian way. The whole pedestrian way. Oh, OK, thank you. This is a new clip-on facility. Mm. And I'm sure it's well engineered. Anything that has to go through Kiwi Rail is very well engineered. Councillor Peter. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, um, for me, this is also a safety issue, and I'll be supporting it. But my question is, the, your, the, the clip-on will deal with the bridge, but it's the entrances and exits at either end. Does it also address those? Because one end's really steep, 
and um, yeah, it's, uh, entrance and exits to it. This specific project just deals with the replacement of the pedestrian bridge structure. It doesn't to deal with the um, approaches at either end. Um, we can the the design enables us to. It enables it's a future proof design. It enables us to consider options for access onto the bridge in the future. Um, yeah, I'm not quite clear on your answer because it's great to have a safe bridge, but if you can't get, or it's unsafe to get to it, then it really defeats the purpose. So, yeah, I would like to see that issue addressed then, please. Yeah, like, um, so the, yeah, at, at the moment, it doesn't address that access on the Wanganui east side with that, with that ramp. Um, and that's purely because it was not something that we could get inside the scope and budget of what we've we've got available to deliver yeah, it's, um, it's it's a piece of work that we um if there's a if there's an instruction to proceed with investigating that work it's something that we can we can investigate okay thank you mayor andrew uh yeah well, i'm going, going to go back to the question that councillor charlie and uh, asked and rob nearly asked and that is the actual bridge itself I'm looking at the degradation of the of the actual pedestrian aspect of it, and uh, does that correlate with the, with the actual bridge? I know it's not our bridge, but um, given the state of the pedestrian access, I, I would have thought that there may be some issues with the. Uh, I'm just automatically jumping in conclusions here, but some issues with the actual bridge structure itself. It's been around. For, I don't know how old it is, but it's an old bridge. I know that. Um, <coughs> Is, so I'd like to see, um, I guess my, my question is, have you contacted or got reassurance from Kiwi Rail as to the longevity of the bridge? The discussions we've had with Kiwi Rail have not indicated any, anything from their, any position from them that would remove that bridge or replace that bridge at this time. Um, we, I haven't seen their direct structural reports on the rail part of the bridge. But anecdotally, their their safety mechanisms for bridges are at the top end of of the sector. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Damien. May I have a mover? Councillor Kate, seconder. Councillor Pate. Um, do I have any? We do. Comments. Hang on, I've got to make this mouth work. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Um, uh, I would have, this feels for me like pretty much a slam dunk sort of decision. Um, whilst I'd like to see a, a clip on to the city bridge, um, I wouldn't see the risks of pedestrians and bikes intermingling across there, given that there's both sides any greater than walking up some stretches of Great North Road um, with the amount of traffic that comes and goes there. Um, and I haven't heard of any discussion at any time that, that that's on the agenda for, for fixing. Um, so, yeah, I'm very much in favour of this. I'd also like to thank you for um, your answers, but in specifically your answer about the mobility scooters and that you understood, understand, that um, some can get over and some can't. And I take that as a real commitment to... Um, the sector of the community that, you know, um, that, that need to, to ride a mobility scooter. So thank you for that. Councillor Josh. <coughs> thank you, and I total for Kate's comments and um, just wanted to uh, first of all say that a couple of months ago, um, Nolene Lane, who's the um, former president of Pedestrians on Wheels, invited me out on a mobility scooter for a couple of hours where um, the two of us attempted to get across the Aramoho Street Bridge. And I can tell you from first-hand experience that it is not easy. 
and um, I very nearly had to um, stand up off my mobility scooter and push it through. It was so difficult, and of course, not everyone has that luxury. In fact, anyone that's using a mobility scooter doesn't have that luxury at all. So I'm um, really happy to see that included in the report and really appreciate your responsiveness to, um, to the disability sector um, throughout our community. Also just want to take the opportunity to acknowledge Councillor Ross, who um, over the years has um, been a pretty consistent advocate of um, issues around the Aramaho Hall Bridge, um, particularly on social media and um, obviously this issue come, comes to us um, from, a, from another angle, but just wanted to take the opportunity to make that acknowledgement as well. Thanks. Councillor Helen, Deputy Mayor. Yeah, thank Councilor you very Helen. much. Um, look, I'm totally in favour of this. I think it's a very pragmatic decision. I know our community has wanted uh, that replacement of the walkway along the, um, the, br the railway bridge for quite for a very long time because I remember campaigning on it also and I've walked over that uh, many times and it's in a shocking state so I'm really pleased our staff are onto it and I think it's a, a great solution so thank you very much. Councillor Michael. Thank you Madam Chair. Yes, um, I, I want to reach out and say to everyone uh, how good are the numbers? It's finally good to have numbers on cycling and pedestrians, so thank you for that. I know it's a sideline, but it's a really good point to put, put out that 3,500 people are cycling, which is great. I'd love to see more cycling numbers, Sarah, throughout. Um, the, this is a good use of prioritization. I think um, the I'm a regular user of this bridge. My kids love it as a rackety bridge. It is fun that it's falling apart to them, but it's not good safety, so I think we should... Um, put the funds where it makes sense. I also don't want to uh, change the motion, Madam Chair, but I do think we need to put an additional motion around um, seeking a project to include the ramps and exits so that the full flow of this project can be, um, um, can capture the full value for my residents. Uh, my colleague to my left point earlier on. Uh, so I'm not sure if you want to have additional motion or just capture that as, a, as an action item to, to look at. Thank you. Can we seek Comment from the CEO on that. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I don't think it's something that needs a resolution. We've we've heard it. It's noted. We'll we'll see what we can do about it. Nice, awesome. Because um, like any system, if you make something really efficient in the middle and the others are there, the productivity decreases. So I think that's a great use. And thank you for your report. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you can imagine me running around in circles celebrating right now, please do. It's not my style to do that, but inside I am celebrating. But I want, I want the public and our new councillors to understand something, that sometimes the public can be pretty scathing and quick to fire comment on this particular issue, as they have done recently on social media. But in those eight years, I understand the eight years, Kiwi Rail was brought to the table seven or eight years ago, they said, yes. Then about a year later, they said, we're out. We missed a funding round with um, uh, Wakakotahi on this matter. Then we applied and we got turned down, I think. And then we reapplied. These take time because we can't fund it ourselves. So there is a history of council strongly advocating to replace the footbridge and obstacles got in the way and finally those obstacles have been overcome. So I'm playing to the camera and saying council has done its very best over eight years but it has been fighting the good fight. Thank you. Final comment, Councillor mm. Ross. Thank you. Yes, I just want to follow on from what Councillor Ross has said that as I said, over the last eight years, this has been a, a high priority in the minds of the public. And um, most of us believed, and, and Councillor Ross alluded to it, that um, this was a Kiwi Rail owned um, bridge and it was their responsibility. And in fact, that was what was put forward by this council. I can think of... Uh, uh, um, discussions that went into the news media saying, well, that's a Kiwi Rail problem. And Councillor Ross just uh, made the point there that 
Kiwi Rail had said for quite a period of time they didn't have the budget. You know, and I think there has been confusion about this, and I think this has cleared it up today that the, the pedestrian bridge is the council, Wanganui District Council's responsibility and that we are getting on with doing something about it. Thank you. I'll now put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried unanimously, yet again. And we know that someone is dancing over there. And um, well, welcome back, Damien and Sarah, to 5.3 Song Parade Dropout. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, consistent with my other papers, thank you for the opportunity to present this paper. Um, I will take the paper as read and I'll highlight um, the following key points. Um, this paper is an update to you all as to where the project is currently at, and this is the um, Somme Parade dropout. This is the dropout into the river um, opposite Axiom Plastics, um, and I've included some pictures within the report to help inform that. Um, the we've, so the current status of this is we've, on Monday, we've just commenced the works to support the gas mains, um, and we'll be advancing the construction of the um, full repair um, once we have the necessary design sign off and we've completed the temporary works. Temporary works are estimated around four to five weeks. Um, the works are being currently undertaken as emergency works. Um, um, Wakotahi has been advised that the costs are likely to be higher than first estimated. So the original estimate for this repair work was two and a half million dollars. Um, so we've advised Wakakotahi that those costs are likely to be significantly higher. Um, Any resp response to that? Sorry. Sorry, they've indicated um, their continued financial support for this project. Um, I've included a table showing a range of potential cost implications. This is not fixing to um, any estimates that we have at this point in time. This is just providing um, councillors with some clarity around what things could look like at a range of scenarios, just to give you a feel for what the situation is. Um, once we've got the detailed design signed off, um, we'll have a quantity survey, do an um, independent cost assessment to inform the likely final construction costs, um, and we will bring this information back to Council um, to keep you informed of the process. Um, again, this is this is essential emergency works. This is um, protecting our primary um, access to the s suburb of Aramoho. Um, <coughs> thanks, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Damien. Um, I'll, I'll go first this time, and. I, I can see that there was an original piece of work and then we've had another drop out and, and, and these numbers, are, they're really getting quite big or the potential to get extremely big. If both these pieces of work are done, what's to, what, what's to stop other pieces in that immediate area falling down as well or is it going to remediate the whole, that whole corner? The proposal at the moment is to remediate that lower section of it. Eventually we will need to consider further expansion extension of the work towards the Aramore Railway Bridge um, to join up with some previous work that was done of a similar nature. Mm. It's going um, to be an ongoing issue, isn't it? Okay. Um, Councillor Helen, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Helen. Yeah, thanks, Damien. Lovely to have you back. Um, I had thought that there's been, there are more issues along that route that, have, that the community have been complaining about and have had orange... Uh, barriers up for some time. So is this the entirety of the current slips in that area or is this only part of them? This is the entirety of the slips in that current area. Okay, so um, so that will, we're looking at um, solving all the identified issues along that route at this stage, although I, I, you know, I hear you, there's still further work to do. Correct. Yeah, thank you. Um, and there's a reference in the report to some of the land may be owned by the 
Port uh, Entity, Port Limited Partnership, uh, and I'm struggling to identify how big that area is or what it is. Is that significant? There's a small slither of land parcel that I've highlighted um, on the third page of the report. Um, it is just a small slither. It's just a administrative matter that we just need to deal with. It's not considered to be um, of significance to affect the delivery of the project works. It's okay. simply there to highlight the process that we're going through and to be transparent with elected members. Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay, very good. Thanks very much. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah, it's a continuation of um, Councillor Jenny's uh, question before. Um, these are obviously emergency uh, uh, works funding that's that's going to address these uh, these issues. Uh, so that's that's fine in and of itself, and it's escalated. Uh, my question is uh, is is around the preventative aspect of other the the rest of the stretch there as well. It's kind of it's carries on from uh, Councillor Jenny's question. It, I don't know how that, uh, you know, what, what this um, looks like uh, from an engineering perspective, but just anecdotally from these pictures here, it looks like a, a site that's very vulnerable to, uh, to erosion. Uh, and so is there any thought while you're doing the emergency works to do some preventative works at the same time? That's my first question. Um. <laughs> The emergency works attract Wakakotahi funding. Um, preventative works may not. Right. Um, it's 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 around budgetary constraints as to preventative works. Um, I can remember after the 2015 storm event, um, a section of Riverbank near Cumbro Place, Roberts Ave, um, subsiding to the river. Um, and that was repaired at the time after that. And there's been numerous other instances along the Adamaho section of the riverbank where it's subsided over over the last few decades. Um, so mm. preventative measures are outside of the emergency works, which is the update that I've given here. Um, okay. But subject to, subject to availability of funds, it, it is, as always, it's something that can be looked at. Yeah, it's all new territory for me, but it does open up the question that if we don't undertake preventative works, then we find ourselves potentially in a situation where we're having to ask for more emergency funding from both Waka Katahi and ourselves, which to me doesn't make sense. But um, anyway, that's how it, how it obviously works. My other question then is around the road, uh, the road itself. Is there any subsidence in the road because of the pressure on the um, because of the Erosion. The subsidence at the moment is limited to an effect on the um, footpath and the boom. Um, that's not to say that further erosion could not impact that, hence why we're um, proceeding with a degree of haste in, in the repairs. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Damien. Councillor Ross. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, in that um, chart you showed us of the possible contributions by Wanganui District Council ranging from 2 million to 2.8 million as our share, and it's stated as unbudgeted. I, th I think, Damien, my question would go to the CE if that's possible. Because it says unbudgeted, maybe I'm preaching to the choir, that means that is not in, that's not, where does that appear in our next rating assessment, the, the payment of that? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, if it's unbudgeted expenditure and it's debt funded, then where it appears will depend on what our closing debt balance is against our original budget for this financial year. So across the board, I think we're underspending. So we are not going to have accrued uh, as much debt as we originally forecast this year, which means there will be no additional impact on rates because we've already anticipated paying for more debt than we've actually got but it is still unbudgeted and therefore not approved by council um, as part of a formal budget setting process does that make sense it does i don't have a second question now 
Councillor Robb. Mm. Um, Damien, I just wanted to refer to the design option uh, that is on the documents, option five, and get your comments on it, please. Um, as I take the the design as the carriageway, then three metres of parking, then four metre shared pathway, then 10 metres of earth fill on top of granular sand fill material. Um, on reading that, it doesn't sound that robust to me. So, I mean, knowing that uh, a lot of this water comes in, comes down from the hills behind and it finds its way to the river, probably quite a low bit, uh, quite even below the water level. But um, so, can you just comment on where that method has been used up there, and has it been? robust over time. And I'm, and I'm thinking that if this would not be in the report if it wasn't sound engineering and if Damien hadn't already felt that it was appropriate. And I so appreciate I'm, that. So I think that you should give him the, answer, the opportunity, opportunity to, to repeat what I just said. The design is based on sound engineering. Um, there is an example of this solution immediately upstream of the area where there has been sheet piling used in this nature. The strength of this design is in the sheet piling. In the, oh, the sheet piling, okay. Two layers of sheet piling. Yeah, so that's what I have read there, sheet piling. Yeah, so engaging with our professional advisors um, on this. This is, the, this is the plan that's been advanced. This has also been advanced in accordance um, in um, discussions with and engagement with um, iwi and hapu they are they believe that this design represents the least visual impact on yeah. on the awa okay thank you that's a, uh, a, a a great answer thank you very much um can i have a mover charlie play charlie and a <coughs> seconder councillor glenda do we have any comments um, I'll make an initial comment, and it doesn't look like there are any others. But I mean, I too, um, I, I take on board um, Mayor Andrew's comment a little earlier about, oh gosh, why aren't we doing preventative works? But what I hear quite clearly is one, serious budget constraint, and two, if we do preventative works, it's not as um, supported by Waka Kotahi as if it's emergency work. So we are kind of putting ourselves in that situation where. We're kind of stuck with doing emergency works because we, we don't have millions and millions of dollars sitting in the budget in order to just take on this preventative stuff. That's my comment. No other comments? Oh, Councillor Kate. Oh, sorry, I was trying to make this. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Um, absolutely support your cordial, Madam Chair. At the same time, and I don't know whether one should say this in public, um, but I'm sure... Anyway. That staff do their don't Damien. Um, I'm sure that staff do their very best to get whatever they can into emergency works that might be described as preventative works. And you couldn't possibly comment, could you, Damien? And you aren't allowed to anyway. So all those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. We are now to 5.4. I'm sure it's welcome back to the table. Damien and Sarah, Emergency Works funding update. Interestingly enough, over to you, Damien. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this, um, again, thanks for the opportunity to present this to you this morning. Um, I'll take the paper as read and I'll highlight a few of the um, key points from it. Um, so 2022-23, our current um, year, has not been a great year for our roading budget um, as we've experienced a, a large number of emergency events that's put quite a bit of pressure on it. Um, emergency works are an unbudgeted expenditure. Um, there is no normal budget line um, for it within our activity for emergency works. Um, there is a minor event budget, um, but this is usually spent pretty early in the financial year um, due to smaller weather events. Um, 
our team has been actively engaged with Wakotei to ensure we receive the greatest amount of funding assistance available from the agency. Um, and whenever there's events, our, our asset managers are very quick to ascertain whether it falls into the funding category from Wakotei for an emergency event or not. Um, we do expect the financial position presented in this paper to change um, because it will include any changes to the SOM parade site that I just presented to. So we, we do expect this position to change. Unfortunately, probably not in a favourable direction. Um, I've, I've bought this paper to elected members at my first available opportunity. This was the first um, committee meeting that I could actually get to after starting. Um, and um, the intention from from the team is um, from the roads to, roading team is to keep elected members updated on this um, on these costs. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Councillor Deputy Mayor, Councillor Helen. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Damien. Look, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the table on page 42. Uh, from why I'm reading this, the total unbudgeted share of uh, emergency works is just over three million dollars for us for the two years, and so that'll be loan funded. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Good concise uh, report. May I have a mover? Josh, seconder, mm -hmm. Ross. Any comment? Doesn't appear so. Thank you very much, Damien, for, for the heads up on it. Oh, no, there is there is a comment. <coughs> very, very late. I, I, I do encourage people to, you know, not, not to leave it till the 13th hour. I'll make it quick and succinct, right. thank you. I'd just like to thank Damien for the reports. I found them very informative and easy to make decisions over. So thank you, Damien, for your first presentation. I look forward to lots more. Um, I, I would like to say I look forward to lots more as well, except that you, you come with high dollar value, so hopefully we won't see terribly much of you. Um, and on that basis, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Great work. And all those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. We now go to 5.5, 5, review of the leading edge strategy. And I think we have Elise and Robin. Over to you, Elise, to lead the way. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. So as you're well aware, this year we've started a review of the leading edge strategy to ensure that our long-term vision works for Whanganui and reflects the current challenges and opportunities. So the report that you have in front of you is what we're calling a reflection document. So this is reflecting back on the leading edge strategy and covering some of the key achievements that have been put in place since 2014. So you'll see that it identifies um, ongoing and incomplete actions as well. And these are really helpful for us in terms of looking forward through the, the review. As hopefully you'll see, much has been accomplished, accomplished since 2014, but we also know that much has changed in Whanganui since then. Our population has grown, there's been significant revitalisation of the town centre, and many big projects have been completed or are underway. However, we know with the changes in the current economic environment, it's clear that a new direction is required to guide the council and the community, which is the purpose in the forward-looking review. And we also want to look back to Council's core purpose to promote community wellbeing now and into the future. So back to the reflection document, what you'll see is the way we've organised it is each page has um, a report back on a strand, so community or connectivity, and we provide an indication of which actions are complete, ongoing, or are yet to be started. I really want to emphasise um, Given the vast array of everything that Council has done and un undertakes in any given year, this is by no means exhaustive. It is extremely condensed down. 
um, to provide some significant insights only. And many of the um, actions you also see are actually more long-term projects um, which will remain as ongoing rather than move into complete because there isn't a start or a finish point for many of these projects. And many of them are actually now embedded in how we work. So they're about how we do it, not exactly what we're going to do. And we really want to emphasise that, such as things around working in partnership with iwi and the community. That's actually well embedded rather than being an, an action out of a strategy we can tick off. I uh, also just wanted to mention that we've started working uh, closely with iwi and hapu, and we've also shared this document with them for any reflections they want to provide as well. So with the reflection document done, it's now time to focus our attention looking forward through the leading edge strategy and the long-term plan work. In terms of next steps, um, we're planning to start broader and community engagement in July this year. And we're allowing for a much more extended period of community input engagement through to completion in June next year. So what we're doing is we're really front-loading community input engagement between now and formal consultation in April, which we'll be doing on the long-term plan and leading edge next year. So rather than waiting for a consultation document next year, which we've often done, we're really trying to front-load the input. We'll be speaking to community groups, businesses and other interest groups in the wider community as well, as well as continuing our active engagement with iwi and hapu. So we'll be weaving this all together. It's quite a big work program, um, but I think the time is right with everything uh, coming together now. So otherwise, um, we will take the report as read and happy to take questions. Thank you. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Um, there was some discussion about whether this would come to this committee or strategy committee, um, but I'm quite happy that it's come here because I want to be a little bit provocative, I think. Um, given the importance of our need, and this has been um, pointed out by Council Mark, um, you know, that report we had, um, the importance of need to prioritise what Council's doing and the fact that we, if you believe us, we've been out more to the community of recent times than maybe ever before. Um, I'm wondering, if I said to you um, or suggested to you, given the information that we've got and the engagement that we've been on so far, could you go and write us a new leading edge strategy and then use that to, and, and then condense the work that we're doing around consultation with the community and, and uh, shorten the process and save some money I certainly wouldn't be able to write it on my own in a vacuum in isolation. It would always have to be a significant team effort. And we have committed to an active partnership approach here to do this hand in hand with Iwi and Hapu. So I want to honour that process and ensure that that's done really well and really thoughtfully. Um, in terms of condensing, we will have a version ready by October. So it, that part of it is not a long process. Um, but what we're doing, which is different, is between July and October, we're gathering the community input and feedback through that process rather than waiting to have a piece of paper. So rather than waiting to have a strategy to sh then share and consult on, we're inviting that engagement and feedback up front. Um, is, does that answer so your question? Or no. you, <laughs> are you looking for... Uh, look, I'm, I'm a... Um, a big fan of community engagement, but I just wonder, you know, given the breadth of what we've got in here and the breadth of what we've done so far, whether in fact we're going to get an added value outcome to it all. Um, that's all. Um, I'm hearing from you that we will, 
um, in terms of honouring, you know, the partnership process that, you know, and I'm absolutely in favour of that. But I just thought I'd ask the question. Something to think about. Something to think about. Processes can always be cut and changed and shortened, and there's lots of different ways to skin a cat, as they say. So we're always up for how we can make things more efficient. But what we also heard was that there were multiple people in the community who felt that their voice wasn't heard. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to ensure that we are getting a diversity of views. I think we're in a really unique time as well, as everyone's well aware, with the economic situation. And it's really important that we touch base with the community um, and all parts of the community and find out what's important to them. And we've started this process through the annual plan. As you'll see, we've got the key themes that were coming out of that. Um, Thank you. I didn't want my I don't want my questioning to be implied as meaning I think this is an inefficient process at all. I just wanted to test it really. I think it was good answers. Thank you. Yeah, she just wanted to be provocative. Deputy Mayor Councillor Helen. Thank you. Um, as you know, we're going into a long-term plan, which sets uh, the budget set and the projects we want to do over the next 10 years. And the time plus there's this uh, very key piece of work setting our direction. Uh, and the first draft of this refresh strategy is expected by October. That's the first draft, uh, and I'm not quite sure how much, yeah, how much further work there'll be after that. But I'm assuming you, you you're seeing that will be, a, you know, the fairly concise already by October. And our staff will have already been doing a lot of work preparing for the long-term plan, and there's a lot of work to do for that. So for me, it's around timing, you know, because theoretically, uh, this piece of work that you're undertaking will set, very much help us set our direction for the next 10 years. And it just sort of feels like we're going to be jumping straight from one thing and then, tr and, and, and then a very rushed process to continue the, L the LTP, do you know what I mean? So that's a concern for me. It almost feels like I would have done this refresh or this, this review of the leading edge strategy in a year that's uh, uh, well away from the LTP. That's all. That's, so my question is, have you got views, thoughts, you know, whatever? I, I've got some views. Uh, David might want to pop in as well. But um, we are required under the Local Government Act to set what are called community outcomes, and those have to be in our long-term plan. So we need those set to feed into the long-term plan. That's why we've set the deadline of October to have the draft. And I would expect the draft would be fairly well worked up by then, that it needs to provide enough detail for everything through the long-term plan to then cascade down right through to performance measures. Um, in terms of timing, for me, the ideal timing would have been that we'd actually had the strategy done prior, mm -hmm. and then we can use the long-term plan to reflect that, because as has been said a number of times, the strategy sets the vision and the direction of travel, what are our big priorities, and then the long-term plan is the way in which we actually implement our strategy. Yeah. So we're doing both at the same time, which is difficult. It's difficult for staff. It is, you know, as we all know, we're, we're strapped for resources um, and time. But I think we have to just make the most of the situation, and that's why we've staggered it as we have. We've also brought on Robin to support the long-term plan program, and there's been a significant amount of work um, already um, that's happened on that and I think we're actually ahead of where we normally are at this time of year so that's um, that's a great start for us um, I also wanted to emphasize that the strategy is really that long-term vision and identity hopefully something fairly simple um, we're, we're going for something that leads back to the community well-beings the four well-beings around the core purpose 
but has enough detail in terms of those focus areas um, to then inform the long-term plan. So I expect we'll have that detail by October, if not earlier. It's, it's hopefully going to be shaping up fairly soon through the process. And as we know, the long-term plan is also a 10-year plan. So in terms of the flow through, there'll be some many things that can be in those out years that don't have to all happen immediately. And we've got the three-year cycle of long-term plans to refresh, but I would expect the strategy would last longer than one cycle. With, as with this one, it's actually endured 10 years. So, you know, that's really efficient in terms of not having to redo our strategy too often. Hopefully that answers your question. I didn't ramble It does. Much. No, I yeah. think that, 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 that's right. And I think the big thing is, um, as you say, not everything's going to happen in year one. So uh, I, was, I was thinking maybe, you know, if, you, if, if, if there was a big change of direction or very much a focus from the community, then we would have to spend some time working up costs, et cetera, and impacts on the LTP. So uh, in future, would there be a, 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 a view to actually changing the timing of, of a... Um, of a leading edge strategy refresh, so it wasn't in the same year as, as leading into an LTP? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, the short answer to that is, is yes, absolutely. Um, it is something that we need to factor into our work programs is the routine and cyclical refresh of our strategies. For this one in particular, it wasn't actually in our work program. But as you've heard from me before, it's approaching 10 years old. We've taken the initiative as officers and went and secured external funding from central government to allow us to get on and do the work. But we only got that confirmed at, at just before Christmas, I think it was. So we are a little bit on the back foot and trying to do things concurrently rather than consecutively. I think the team are up for the challenge without heaping too much pressure on them. But going forward, yes, we do need to be a bit more organised and better prepared for these kind of things. Thank you. I appreciate the responses. Mayor Andrew, remembering that we are in question time. You're reminding me, are you? No, no, uh, not you. The room. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll have some comments soon as well, but uh, the, the first question I've got is one you mentioned the word identity before, uh, and I think that's particularly important. Um, vision and strategy is one thing, but it's underpinned by our identity, our purpose, who we are. Uh, my question is, what, how are you uh, incorporating identity uh, into this piece of, into the Leading Edge review? So when we're engaging with um, the community and the various groups that we've been talking to, I think it's about asking them questions that elicit a response around identity. So asking them, you know, what are you proud of about Whanganui? What do you think of when you think of Whanganui? What's the first thing that comes to mind? And those kind of questions to elicit that before we're jumping into the future thinking and the strategy words. Points of difference. So yeah, on, points yeah. of difference. Yeah. yeah, what makes Whanganui unique yep. to other centres. And there is, as we know, plenty here that's that's unique and special. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the leading edge name is the other one as well. And it was, in fact, uh, in 2014, I sat just where you are right now <laughs> and with, with, with a couple of others. And the leading edge name was born just right where you were sitting, funnily enough. Um, and, um, and so... I, so look, I've got a bit of personal history here because having come up with the, the, the concept at the time, um, I'm not precious if leading, the leading edge name disappears or not, but it does appear to uh, be, uh, my, 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 my provocation at the time was that we needed to see this have some longevity. It has, it's been nearly 10 years in existence, it's great. Uh, the question is, um, is it still, do you still believe it's a re the relevant uh, uh, phrase for capturing our vision and direction for Whanganui? Gosh, that's really putting me on the spot, and also in terms of my future career trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks. You'll, you'll be fine. <laughs> Ten years <laughs> from now. <laughs> 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 
It's just that it's come up a, a um, few times. That's all look, I'll give my honest answer. I think leading edge was the right term at the time, but I think things have changed. I think we're in a really different environment economically, socially, and some of the wording that's coming through is more around things that are about connecting up people and cohesion and neighbourhood and obviously the AWA has become much more front and centre, rightly so. Um, so that would be my own opinion, but I think it has to be fully informed by community, iwi hapu, and the feedback that we get. Mm. And this has been enduring for 10 years. So I think it, maybe, uh, <laughs> hopefully I haven't just oh, um, no, <laughs> limited my career. <laughs> my career options, no, David might want to also certainly, um, certainly pitch in, it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm, I'm going to jump in and save Elise, and I don't think you've done any uh, any lasting damage there. Look, my 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 view. <laughs> <laughs> no, no damage. Should have said. I, I just no, want to jump in here. You have done no, no damage. damage. I'm not. Pre I'm I am not precious at all. Um, it's just uh, it's just what what you're seeing, and I, I actually what I actually I hope that you can actually provoke. There is a different phrase potentially to to. Uh, to to uh, to basically um, reflect the change, changing times and where Wanganui is heading in the future because that was relevant for then. We've seen Tower to Pua happen. We've seen um, UNESCO City of Design. We've seen a number of other things which, which suggest that we're leading edge. We're front footed. We're trailblazers. Now it might be different. So anyway, um, mm. anyway. Well, I was just going to support Elise, although foot and mouth syndrome apparently. Um, <laughs> I think Elise is on, on the money. We need to keep an open mind and wait and hear what our community's got to say. They may come back to us and say, yep, leading edge still ticks all the boxes and resonates, or they may, as Elise said, uh, alluded to, come back and say, actually, things have shifted. At this stage, open mind is the best policy from my point of view. At the leading edge workshops and he's still doing okay <laughs> <laughs> so uh, well done Elise and I think your career is um, probably enhanced as opposed to um, impacted by that we, we now move to the resolution um, which is to receive the report review of the leading edge strategy can I have a mover and a seconder Kate and Charlotte Any comments? We do have a comment or two. Councillor, Councillor Kate. Uh, thank you. Um, I think this is really good work. Um, and I think uh, the officer's answer to the mayor's question was perfect. Um, and if you ever need a referee, I'll be happy to help. <laughs> Councillor Peter. Yes, I'd just like to um, say that uh, I fully support this. I think it's a good strategy to work on a strategy. Thank you. Mayor Andrew. Uh, I, I, I want to say uh, thank you to Robin and Elise for the great work that you've done so far. I've been involved in the process, so uh, hopefully, <laughs> and I certainly don't want to get the impression that you've um, uh, that any any changes or uh, that you make to this uh, pro or to to the name or anything like that is uh, is going to be uh, career affecting. But uh, I no, I, you've done a great job so far. My my comment really is um, a couple of things. Um, I'd like to see. Uh, for everyone around the table here and for others, how the integration between the long-term plan and leading edge occurs, the kind of visual representation or the, the process and how the overall process plays out. I think it is what it is that we've got the situation where they, they're both colliding at the same time. Um, I, that, that's, just, that's just the reality at the moment. But uh, uh, we've got you know, a new council, we've got uh, a relatively new chief executive, and so that, uh, that the timing is, is unfortunate, but I still think it's very doable. Um, the the other one as well is that uh, you know I, I think we need to think about lo leading edge as a as a long term vision and strategy. It's not just a strategy; it's a vision and strategy. Uh, the vision is uh, potentially out to say ten years time. So uh, whilst um, whilst uh, the we're in a situation right now uh, across the, across the country and uh, in Monganui itself where things are challenging, 
we will come out of that at some stage and we still need to set our sights on being ambitious and bold and um, for the future as well. So hopefully that comes through in the, in the review. Thank you. Councillor Michael. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, I just want to first of all say absolutely um, long-term vision, direction, the definition of strategy is very ambiguous, and I really want to put out there that the definition of a long-term direction for Wanganui is far more appealing and long-lasting. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to our councillors who have been here before me and to the officers and the staff who have implemented this strategy for, since 2014. I think you've done a cracking job, um, and it was a different period. It was a boom market in Wanganui, and you took full advantage of that. You grew Wanganui. You trailblazed, you did a fantastic job. We are in a different time though. This is a different time. This is, uh, you've got global economical predicaments that we can't control. We have a central government that is complex with lots of unknown unknowns who we can't control. We have a population that's boomed here that is not no longer filled with the old boys club of collegiate. People from Auckland, from overseas, from everywhere, and not only are they voters, but they're building businesses. And I'm, and I'm sorry, that is the new Wanganui. And I look forward to it. I look forward to the changes they want to make to Wanganui. So I look forward to talking to them. I think our CE and the staff and our mayor and elected members, I think we're up for the challenge. I look forward to this um, going ahead for some changes. Um, and um, I think what Elise and team have done with talking to our um, residents is the way forward to create an adaptive strategy that dynamically prioritizes objectively for greater economic and social value to create a greater Wanganui. So thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ross. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's been an incredibly positive um, session thus far. Um, when the Mayor was talking to Elise about um, uh, Wanganui's identity, I made some quick notes because um, Elise said that when we go out to community we ask what makes Wanganui unique. I won't explain each one because there's eight, but I'll keep it very brief. This, this is what I noticed when I came, I was away from home 32 years. This is what I noticed when I came back nine years ago that makes Wanganui distinctive to me to any other place in this country. This is why I love it here. When there's a funeral out to the cemetery, mm -hmm. the cars pull left. Visitors are floored by that. We still have the Kiwi twitch. You can't do it in Sydney because it means something else. Um, we are incredibly open to visitors. We are increasingly bilingual in our casual and our formal conversations. Uh, we have long-standing, successful, low-level co-governance examples in our town. Virginia Lake, Pukinamu, oh sorry, Rotokawa, Virginia Lake, uh, Pukinamu. We have a degree of, um, we have massive inclusion of iwi with lots more to come over the next uh, little while. We are the 10 minute city. We can locate and go to nearly everything that we need to see before we go out to the rural areas within 10 minutes. And we should go more out to the rural areas. We are still what I believe is that Kiwi egalitarian society where no matter what your income and your status is, up or down, we all seem to be on a level playing field. Um, we also have that massive example to the rest of the nation of urban renewal, the partnership between Castle Cliff, Progress Castle Cliff and Council. What a massive plus that is that makes us unique. So when we do the re leading edge review, I would be interested in what that new name will be. Thank you. I'm not 100% sure whether you can get from Outer Castle Cliff to the Aramaho Cemetery in 10 minutes. It might be closer to 20, but I do take your I do take your point from the centre. From the centre, yes, I, I I agree. It's it's wonderful, Councillor Charlotte. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, touch on what Elise was saying about connectivity, connection. Um, I think the two major 
things that have happened, um, you know, I mean globally but also locally, since this leading edge strategy is Te Awatupua and COVID and um, both of those um, situations require uh, collaboration over consultation and um, I really appreciated Elisa's answers around um, how we are going to be consulting this um, this strategy in terms of collaboration and that feeds very much into um, the outcomes of, of how we are implementing the changes of the Te Awatupua Act um, but also in terms of COVID you know I mean our community is disconnected and isolated and um, and I think that you know it was really poignant to point that out in terms of where we need to go with the strategy so thank you Thank you. I will now put the motion receiving the report of the leading edge strategy. All of those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. We now move to 5.6. Should have turned that page already. And I welcome Stuart Hilton to, to the table to present the Waste Management and Minimisation Plan 2021-27. Actions update. Thank you, Madam Chair, councillors. Um, this is a standing report that goes to the Council of Sustainability and Waste uh, Working Party um, and is brought here for your information. Um, and it was reported, this report was reported to their meeting of 1st of June. Um, you will see in that that um, the key actions and deliverables that uh, we've been working on is the curbside waste services uh, that we're working up. Uh, that will come as no surprise to you and the rest of the plan's actions are documented there. I'll take them as read. I wanted just to raise two issues that I think you should be aware of on a national scale that are happening. One is the new government waste strategy that has uh, recently been brought out. Um, that is multifaceted. Um, it is, if I could use the term of the last item, it is sort of leading edge. Um, and is welcomed by officers, um, we will have a report to the next uh, Waste um, uh, and Sustainability Advisory Group on the implications of that strategy to Council. Um, and following on from that, uh, part of that is some legislative reviews that will be happening at a national level. One of them is around construction and deconstruction waste, where the Government is proposing to have waste plans as part of your building applications for new builds and also for demolition. Um, there's a lot of work that still needs to go on in that and to what that might look like for uh, builders, developers, but also for council and for officers in terms of who approves what and against what. Um, but um, I think you just need to be aware that that is being worked up and the legislation is uh, due to come out in 2024-25. I'm happy to take the reporter's read and answer any questions. I have a, a quick question for you. Uh, Stuart, with regards to volume of waste, and I'm, I'm speaking for the Whanganui district, as far as volume of waste goes, my understanding is that things like the, the construction and demolition waste is far greater in volume than the domestic waste. Is that...? Ab absolutely. It's around the 40 to 50 per cent. Uh, depending on where we're at, um, whether we're in a boom cycle, which we have been, um, or not, um, and what's happening in the sector of construction, deconstruction. But yeah, it's it's a huge part that goes um, undetected, if you like. Yeah. Deputy Mayor Councillor Helen. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, can I ask how often this particular report comes to this committee? Good question. Um, we will be reporting quarterly to the advisory group, and I expect it would come here after that, that, that group as well. Thank you. Um, I'm reading it alongside the uh, project status report on page 125 for curbside recycling, because I think that's relevant, even though it comes later in the port. Um, is that OK if I question you on that? Because I presume that's part of your report. Happy, happy to have a question and I'll 
okay. consider whether we answer it or inc or okay. uh, the to key, answer it. Well, one of the things is in the project status report, it still says that the curbside recycling and food scrap service will start from 1st of July 2023 and 1st of July 2024. That's obviously incorrect, isn't it? Because it's the curbside's not till 1st of April 2024. That's the current, that's what's in your report, so. No. Yeah, that's what we went out in procurement uh, times. Um, there was negotiations happening, um, so those dates will change. Yes, yeah, correct. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure who's marrying the two reports together. That just needs alignment. Um, I, I, I'm a bit confused also because there's this repeated, um, uh, and, and it's in the project status report, food scraps trial will start in August. Why are we doing a food scrap, I presume this is under your purview, why are we doing a food scraps trial when we've already gone to tender on the food scraps? Um, it's to test the methodology and, and the, um, it's, it gives us a chance to do some of the rollout and, and, and develop the collateral that will go with the curbside, the full curbside service. Um, and it was a decision, decision, decision of council previously to have a food scraps trial um, to, to do that. For that reason. So is the trial just to sort of f sort out the communications or actually to see if it's warranted or needed or what the result will be? Uh, not warranted but it tests some of the assumptions that we've used. Um, as you'd expect uh, curbside recycling is well used and well documented and, and, um, and a service that's provided throughout New Zealand. Food scraps is a bit more um, New, newer service, um, not that many councils have taken it up and are about to, so uh, there's less known about it, so we uh, thought it would be a good idea to do the trial to upskill ourselves in, in that area. But it's primarily to test um, the communications and the, the rollout that might happen uh, later on for the full service. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm just still confused as to why we would go out to tender for it before we've actually completed the trial. Are they not, does one not rely on the other to inform the other? Well, just going to add to about the food scraps trial, um, that uh, um, decision was taken when we went to the long-term um, plan amendment. So a couple of decisions were made, go to market to get a curbside recycling and food scraps um, contract and to do a food trial test because we had some questions about um, food scraps. Uh, so we're just um, following through with uh, previous decisions. Um, to reiterate Stuart's earlier comments, um, there's food scraps trials underway and other regional councils that are about to roll the service out as well, um, Manawatu being, being one of them. It's a very, very good le learning opportunity to um, uh, do and take before you roll out a full service. Um, it helps with communications, it helps with um, you know, myth busting, uh, a, a number of um, elements. Um, so, so that's why we've got the trial on the go. Yeah, I've got no trouble with that. It's just yeah. timing. I've just, I, I mean, we've known about the amendment for about a year, mm. so I'm just amazed that we haven't done the food scraps trial because it's been reported every time we're doing the food scraps trial and we still haven't done it. So I guess I'm I, I'm really interested in why we haven't started it. So the timing, um, when we entered into procurement um, in around October last year, uh, we sort of went to the ground a little bit um, with some of our contractors that might be able to do the, the trial uh, and we're just coming out the other side of procurement. So that gives us the opportunity to, to work with our partners um, outside of that commercially sensitive arrangement. So that, that's the rationale for the timing. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, Sorry to butt in. <laughs> and, and from reading this report, because it's reasonably brief, uh, and, and sort of, I'm sorry, you know, I'm reading it and there's a lot of words, but not a lot of action, uh, and I don't mean that uh, action uh, specifics, there's not a lot of specifics yeah. uh, I presume most of the focus has been on the curbside mm -hmm. collection rather than anything else <coughs> Excuse me um, Yes, and that's what I said up front um, but saying that um, we are working with certain partners to forward the, the, the actions that are working there I mean uh, 
for instance, the bylaw creation is a, is a work that will come before you uh, and will set the scene for some of the things that we're wanting to do. Um, but, yeah, it's fair to say that the, the focus has been on curbside recycling yeah. and uh, food scrap service and capacitising our, um, our waste team yeah. um, to deliver on some of these things. Thank you. And, and I'll, I'll be very interested in the next report in three months' time, whatever, that we get a bit more detail to this committee too around the uh, government's proposals. That would just be really good to have that snapshot. I don't know if Question. you intended to, but that would be really good. Um, and, uh, and you haven't reported on the size of the government waste levy that we currently have, but I presume that's, in the, that's, that's building up every time. Yes, there's the ongoing uh, waste levy fund, um, which is going up over a five-year period of from $10 a ton at landfill to uh, $60 a ton. Um, we're, we're four years into that um, transition as it, as it climbs, so the funding coming to council has increased uh, roughly from 175 per annum to around circa 600k. Um, we have yet to see how that's going to play out over the long term because there will be um, consequences for that fund going up in terms of quantities going to landfill, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That gives you a rough outline of yeah. the amount coming in. Yeah. And I presume it's hoped that some of our uh, community can take advantage of that through funding applications. I know there's been a bit, but they're no, nowhere touching it, is it? It's, it's not, and remember we um, have made a conscious decision to use some of that historical funding that we've put away for the curbside and potentially going to use some of that um, levy fund um, to support the, the rollout of curbside services. Um, so there's, there's not a lot that will be left for funding, but it is our intention to leave some there for community initiatives. Lovely. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, and, and just to add to that, I guess the, by virtue of the fact that we've got some money to put aside for the service is um, a reflection on we haven't been able to um, attract enough interest to the levies over time. Um, so what interest we have had um, through the funding applications by and large have been well supported. If I could just add to that. Uh, uh, and I might be speaking out of turn a little bit, but um, in terms of the fund, I think we need to refresh the fund and rethink what it's there for. Uh, and it's a bit of my intention that uh, p potentially we need to um, target the fund to where we want it to go um, and to look at maybe construction, deconstruction, for instance, and look to target the funding to, to achieve certain results in, in line with our strategy. I'm now going to... Um Ask for a mover and a second of the motion. Kate Bender. Thank you. Uh, we have comments. Councillor Rob. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Jenny. Um, thank you, Stu, for the presentation. Um, I, I, I am rather confused about what we're doing here, and I, I, I think we do have to. Uh, enter into some discussions about these agendas. I thought the objective was that uh, items were, were listened to by council only once. And here we're already doing it twice on this one, one item. Anyway, um, let's take that uh, discussion up. As, as ter in terms of the, the food waste trial, councillors will know that I was never a supporter of this and I declare that again the $392,000 that it's going to cost would be far better spent on the introduction of the service to help out the ratepayer. Now, I know there's an application into the um, uh, MFE to cover it. If it does, great. But the best trial is simply to get onto the five councils that are already offering the service and getting the pros and cons of how to do this. Um, and, uh, in, in terms of the, the, as the food waste... Um, collection was raised. Um, I'd encourage you to read the spin-off article on the food waste collections that have just been introduced into Auckland. The, and the uh, targeted rate is $78.21 per household. So perhaps our price is pretty competitive. Thank you. Thank you. I will um, 
make a, a brief comment that I was very pleased to hear Stuart comment about the construction and demolition waste aspect being um, focused on through through government because I know that that is where the biggest target is and I often feel that members of the community are placed in the position of having to deal with things when in fact the biggest causes or users or whatever of a particular issue are not um, are not put under the thumb to, to, to deal with it. So I'm really pleased that that is happening and I think it's a far more important thing to deal with than curbside recycling and in particular food waste, which as you know doesn't have my support. So on that basis I put the recommendation, all those in favour, against carried. Thank you very much Stuart. We're now going to take a brief five minute break. I warn you that it is going to be, I was going to say two but I didn't quite trust him. Five minute break um, and we're going to change chairs so if we can go offline for five minutes um, and
Cool. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we are on to item number 5.7, Climate Change Work Program Update. Um, this involves... The purpose of this is to provide an update on the Climate Change Program. We will be joined by Climate Change Advisor Caroline uh, Arrowsmith. Thank you. Uh, Morena Koto. Yep, so as Michael said, the purpose of this is to give an update on the Climate Change Work Program. Um, the report breaks down actions in the Climate Change Strategy into the five key areas, uh, which are uh, leadership and collaboration, home and building energy, transportation and urban form, uh, sustainable food systems and waste, so saving the whole world. Um, and the key highlights since the last update are, of course, the completion of the Council's first organisational carbon footprint, um, the energy audits of Council facilities um, that there is um, attached as well. The EcoBulb Home Energy Saver project is uh, now complete. There were 620 households um, included in that. And the uh, second Climate Action Fund is opening next week on Monday. Ooh, and other than that, I'll take the paper as read and answer any questions. Thank you, um, Karen, for that. Uh, we'll now open the floor for questions and clarifications from members regarding item 5.7. Uh, please address all questions to the chair. Councillor Charlie. Yes, thank you. Um, page 78, the frightening carbon footprint of the wastewater treatment plant, is that just the, the dry or is it that causes it so high? Um, as I've said in the advisory room, we asked that we haven't looked into the wastewater treatment plant too deeply yet. Um, and that's simply because of the uncertainty from central government around who's going to be taking control of that asset, of the operations of it. Um, so that one, if uh, if, it, if we do decide to head into the, um, that direction, we will look into it more deeply then about what's causing that. It's pretty standard though across the country that wastewater treatment plants um, take up a large portion of our carbon footprint. Councils. Councillor Jenny? Oh, oh it's actually me. Councillor oh, Jenny is yeah, yeah. Mayor Andrew. I'd have to Apologies. speak with a squeaky voice. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -oh. Sorry, I didn't mean it like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll just shut up. Yeah. Um, so, Question, uh, questions, please. Yeah, Andrew, sorry. Um, question is uh, the I'm, I'm a participant on the Manawatu Wanganui Joint Climate. Um, committee, and they've got a, 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 a strategy. How does this integrate with the Manawatu Wanganui uh, climate change strategy? You mean the regional climate the action regional plan? Regional climate action plan, yes. Yeah. Um, so the, that is part of our strategy, working on it. But the actions for the regional climate action plan, the specific actions, are currently being worked out in the work program. So what I work on, our climate change strategy, is our local response to climate change. So it's what this council is doing within our own organisation on our emissions and with our community. And the regional one is the regional lens. So that is working in collaboration with other councils. And it's still... So it's part of it, but it's separate. Sure. So, yeah. so this is the actions for local climate change initiatives has gone first uh, because the, the the regional action plan is not completed? Well, they come first because our strategy was adopted in, was it 2020, okay. 2021? Yeah. Right, okay, so I'm uh, uh, just understanding how, mm. how it works, but uh, eventually it'd be nice to see, and it's more, probably more of a comment than a question now, but it'd be good to see how that integrates with um, we can have a, a regional and local approach uh, integrated. That the um, would be yes. ideal in the future. So anyway, thank you for that clarification. The regional plan does contain it contains a mix of um, suggestions that councils can adopt themselves, and also regional joint initiatives. And we're already doing a lot of those things that are recommended in there already. 
Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for your report. Um, one question, um, and maybe I haven't done my readings, but um, the crematoria, cremating our people, and roughly half our people choose cremation. It's a huge carbon emitter um, from the gas burners. Is there any consideration into investigating that matter? It hasn't. It's not a priority at the moment, I will say. Um, that is obviously a sensitive issue, and we are currently looking at the low-hanging fruit, and we're looking at our own organisational emissions, so we're not looking at the crematorium just yet. Yeah, um, Elise, looks like she might want to jump in. Yeah. Just to add to that, those solutions are incredibly expensive. So while um, they would be great at this point, as Caroline said, we're focusing on where we can get some immediate carbon savings as well as cost savings for Council, and that would come at a significant cost at this time. However, technology may change in the future, so something to keep an eye on. Thank you. Can I remind our members to um, put questions to the Chair? Out of respect to the Chair. Thank you. Councillor Ross? Uh, Councillor Josh? Sure thing. Through you, Mr Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, appreciate the report and um, just a question around the Climate Action Fund. Can you give us a snapshot of the criteria for that, for that fund? Oh, you're putting me on the spot off the top of my it head. Doesn't need to be, it doesn't <laughs> need to be point by point, but just keen to understand that a bit more. Yes, so they have to be local projects uh, within Whanganui. They have to have, because climate change is incredibly broad, the criteria is left fairly broad on purpose, has to either reduce carbon emissions, uh, increase the resilience of our communities, mm -hmm. um, it has to help with adaptation in some way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in terms of the eight projects that were funded last year, apologies if I've missed it, but is there a reporting mechanism around us understanding what those projects were? Um, they are all published on our website. Okay. So it's very transparent who sure. was funded. Um, and there is a report on the, more of the detail into mm -hmm. who got the funding, but last year we didn't have to go through that process of bringing it to Council. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, Councillor Kate. Thank you, uh, through the Chair. Um, <coughs> this, the, um, oh, what's the name of it, the carbon report, the, um, you know, carbon producing report that you've um, included in your um, report today, and thank you. Um, <coughs> And you've already alluded to, um, like the crematoria, um, because it's so expensive, it would be, you know, we'll, we'll wait a little while. Can you talk to us a little bit about how um, the report on what's emitting carbon and what's not um, is helping you, us, prioritise our actions going forward in this plan? Um. So this is one piece of the puzzle, the carbon footprint. This is the looking at our um, carbon emissions. This is fully in mitigation. So of course, there's other aspects of community resilience and adaptation and all of that. So this helps us to understand the emissions that we are contributing to and what areas we need to focus on in the next few years. So as I said, we're not focusing on um, the wastewater treatment plant, as you can see, that is a massive part of it. You'll see that the next um, biggest part is our, essentially our contractors. That's everything that council purchases. So that includes downers, that includes the concrete on the roads. That's why that's so high. We have quite limited control over those emissions currently. Um, so the big focus for this year and this long-term plan is going to be on gas and electricity. Uh, within the council, which is hopefully going to reduce our costs and carbon emissions. Thank you. Um, my next question would be, uh, and this might need the chief executive to answer, because I'm wondering about the future aspirations and projects committee and how that will form part of this prioritisation process. 
in terms of, you know, as we move forward. I mean, it sounds like low-hanging fruit, you know, some are, are pretty straightforward, but as we prioritise even further, how is that going to work? Chief Executive. Uh, through you, Chair, um, I think it's twofold. Um, as Caroline has already outlined, the, the inventory of our emissions allows us to start prioritising. Um, and in an ideal world, we'll be looking at, um, I suppose, prioritising the our emissions reductions in terms of uh, most cost effective first, so that we can um, remove the cheapest carbon, if you know what I mean, um, rather than just focusing on what our biggest emitters are, um, what's going to have the best return financially so that we can um, be as cost effective as possible. That's looking at individual projects with the specific purpose of um, mitigating our carbon emissions. The second aspect, though, that the business case process needs to look at is how do we apply a climate change mitigation lens to all of our projects? Um, and that will be um, looking at things like how do we um, re-specify materials that we use that have got a lower carbon footprint in their construction phases, that embodied carbon piece, which is um, that supply chain piece that uh, Caroline's talked to about where our contractors are contributing it mm -hmm. to it. Simple things like looking at our footpath renewal program, we know that there's low carbon concrete products on the market that may be a relatively cheap and easy substitute for your regular vanilla uh, concrete that we're purchasing at the moment. Um, we've already made moves to um, switch from normal bitumen bright sealing products to emulsions. Those typically have half the carbon footprint to your traditional projects. So again, getting the business case and the project prioritization process to actively apply some thinking to those spaces is, is how we'll do it. And it will help populate the 10-year plan, the long-term plan? Yes, and, and effectively what we want to be doing is looking at every time we spend a dollar, what is the opportunity to decarbonize our operations um, and apply that lens to everything we do right the way through the entire 10-year plan. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm probably sort of repeating some things, but in and thank you uh, for that response in terms of future purchasing. Uh, and this is a very comprehensive report, it's huge. I guess my biggest concern is when you've already got sunk costs in an existing uh, asset, mm. let's say it's a, fur a gas furnace and it's in really good condition, although ideally it's probably, you know, it's probably creating emissions, I mean, you really only want to replace it when it's at the end of its life because there's already sunk cost in, the, in even making that thing. So in terms of what we're looking at, we're taking a practical lens. That's the way we're looking at it, yep. Yep, 100%. And Council has a lot of assets and different boilers and they're all at different stages. They've been renewed at different times or replaced. So that will definitely be taken into account, their natural life cycle yeah. that they have. Um, Thank you. Does that satisfy? Yeah, so we're taking a prudent and practical, pro pragmatic approach and just not, we must save this ounce of carbon at all costs. No, well, as David said, it has to be cost effective. Yeah. So if we're pulling out an old boiler that's just been put in 10 years ago and it's got a 30, 50 year life span, that's not a cost effective thing to do. Unless the carbon price goes, unless we get to a point where we have to pay for carbon and the carbon yeah. price is so high that it does become effective to remove it, but we're not at that point right now. What's our total budget for this climate change, our annual budget? So for the coming year, we have 100,000 for the community fund. So 100% of that goes to community groups. And we have 50,000 for our adaptation and risk work. So it's a really small budget relative. And I just also want to acknowledge that Caroline is part time and she is our sole climate change person. So we do run a fairly um, tight ship, and I think, you know, we deliver a lot for what we what we uh, have. 
if Thank I can. You. Sorry, that wasn't a. Sorry, <laughs> through the chair, that was not a <laughs> question necessarily. I was just wanted to take that time to acknowledge that. Thank you. And through the chair, so um, obviously salaries of staff such as Caroline would be on top of that budget. Yes, that's an additional through the, the OPEX line. Yeah, and um, and are we happy with the, with the results from that 100,000 community fund? It's quite a lot of money. Are we happy with how the results, that type of applications and the value added that's giving? Um, so the fund has always been called a two-year trial. So last year was the first year, this is the second year, then we're going to review it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just a clarification question for myself. Uh, you mentioned lifespan. So we're using lifespan, not depreciation. Not sure what the right word is, but every asset has, has a lifespan on it. Um, and it's important to know that those all have different time frames. And as I say, and we're all, they're all at different points. So. Um, for me, lifespan is probably more understandable to the general public. Can you confirm, CE? So look, uh, in aid of clarifying, the, the intention is that when assets reach that point where we need to replace them anyway, that is our opportunity to, to decarbonise um, our operations for the lowest possible cost because we're going to be spending money on a new asset anyway. Um, that's going to be our priority. Um, doing things outside of that renewal cycle then comes down to a, a business case approach because with the cost of carbon, there may be a compelling reason to do something early because it actually becomes the lowest cost opportunity. Um, but we'll take those on a case-by-case -case basis. Cool. Last question from Councillor Rob. Thank you. Through you, Michael, um, Chair, um, the um, chart on page 86 is uh, very interesting in terms of Council's emissions. Um, the 40% um, purchase goods and services and capital goods, 40% of our emissions. So I'd just like to ask a question of the Chief Executive here is that First of all, can anything, any focus be given to these purchases that might change that figure down, lower it? Is it practical to do something like that? Or is that something that we just have to accept? Uh, three, Chair. Um, I haven't quite got to the page that you're on, but I think this is... Um Yes. Yeah, so look, I think this to, uh, goes back to the comment I made earlier on. It's about the embodied carbon in our infrastructure and our operations. So concrete footpaths is the example I gave before. Yeah. Yes, there are opportunities, but some of these things are going to be difficult to deal with. Um, other things like our wastewater treatment plant, um, if I circle back to that, um, that produces screenings, waste that's a biohazard that has to go to landfill that produces carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, trying to solve that and mitigate the carbon there is incredibly difficult. We're probably looking at some future technology that doesn't exist. Um, so it's a mixed bag. It's going to take time to work through this. Um, but in the meantime, absolutely low-hanging fruit that we can start to tackle. Yeah. Um, wastewater treatment plant is, is identified at the top there. Uh, the purchase goods and services, though, is something that's uh, part of our procurement system, procure, procurement policy. Is there anything in the, the new policy that covers this um, reduction in emissions? Uh, through you, uh, Chair, yes, um, certainly the environmental broader outcome is, is one where uh, it would be obvious, but I think it goes, it's earlier than procurement. Um, our contractors were kind of the, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff at that point. It goes way back to how we specify and design our infrastructure in particular, because that'll be where the biggest emissions are embodied. Um, that's through our material selections and how we as a, an asset owner choose to own, design and operate and build our assets. 
but at the procurement stage, yeah, there's still opportunity and our procurement policy incentivizes people to put forward emission saving opportunities uh, when they bid for our works. If I can make a comment to, to through the chair, sorry, <laughs> to Rob, um, the, the data there for the procurement section is an estimation as well. So they've had to do that through the dollar spend. Um, so part of this is about getting better data as we go continually as we measure our footprint. And part of that is putting into the procurement policy that our, potentially our suppliers need to do their own carbon footprint so they can supply us with that information. Um, so it's less of a guesstimation. Um, and some of the things are bigger, like Dave was saying about the concrete and things, some of them are, you know, it includes also our post that we get, all of our deliveries. It includes the stationery by um, our IT systems. It includes like everything. So yeah, there is a lot of opportunity there, but we just have less control over it. Would it help the member if we were to take an action for a matrix of cost to benefit realization in a scatter diagram? Would that help you visualize it? The Waste and, and Sustainability Advisory Group, and those are the questions that and Josh is leading this area in the in that group. Um, that's the sort of question that will come before that and um, go and, and be addressed in depth. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Rob. Thank you very much. So we have um, that the Operations and Performance Committee received the report, Climate Change Work Programme Update. Um, can I have a seconder? Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Do we have any amendments to this? No? Thank you very much. Um, do we have any comments? None. Being friendly for me, thank you. Um, I'll reread the motion then, that the Operations and Performance Committee receive the report, Climate Change Work Programme Update. Um, what's the words? All in favour. All in favour, thank you. Uh, <laughs> is there any against? Any against? No? Carried, thank you. Well done. <laughs> Once done. I didn't write that step down. All in favour. There you go, thank you. Uh, we move on to um, 5.8, the housing strategy update um, on progress update of our housing strategy. Community wellbeing manager Lauren Tamahana is going to join us. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora. Uh, Thank you for the opportunity today. This paper is a progress update on the housing strategy, and I just wanted to uh, note some key points. Um, in your colour coding, you'll note that there's two variations of the orange. One is because those projects are ongoing, and the other is to show that those projects have actually started and are underway. Uh, 1.8, Kaihora have come back to us now, and they won't be moving forward with the lease that, that on the land, the lease arrangements that we had been an initial discussion with them, um, so that's a change that we will need to go back to. Uh, 2.1, healthy homes uh, in, are in place, and at the time we had talked about, uh, in our strategy, we talked about a, um, a building warrant of fitness, and that was superseded by the healthy homes, but uh, that's, I just wanted to note that that's a watch this space because the Greens are calling for rental warrant of fitnesses, so that might be something that um, comes back up onto the uh, strategy. Um, and as Caroline talked about, um, the where Council partnered with EcoBulb and 620 home home energy assessments were completed with LED light bulbs and efficient shower heads installed. Um, and finally, 4.2, so the shower and office block uh, for Topol Key should be on site next week, and then we just need the connections to water and electricity to be completed. Building and resource consent processes are underway uh, for both those areas. 
Um, and finally, we are working in partnership with Tupuhu um, and have contracted WSP to complete a feasibility study on the longer term options for homelessness in Whanganui. So I'll take my, the rest of my papers read and if there are any questions. Thank you, Community Wellbeing Manager Lauren. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, lots of questions. Uh, Councillor Jenny. Mayor, uh, Mayor Andrew. Uh, Mayor Andrew. Um, so I'm just trying to, uh, ref and it's more of a clarification perhaps for the Chief Executive actually. Uh, we were, had a housing workshop as councillors back in November, end of last year, um, and I'm just wondering, uh, is that the outputs of that work integrated into the housing strategy? Uh, through you, Chair, um, some but not all of those seven initiatives that were discussed at um, that workshop are covered by this update. Um, we can certainly broaden the scope of this to include the others. Um, and bring it to future reports. Uh, Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is a question for the CE. Um, in the past, you have talked about um, like an incentive program or a guide that would help with subdivisions. You know, perhaps mum and dad who want to subdivide, it would be a tool to help. I see a few sort of things scattered in here, but is that more a consolidated bit of work still to do or mm. not? Uh, through you, Chair, so that's a piece of work that's um, still to be completed. Our district planning team have already done a high level assessment um, looking at the potentially, the, the land that's available that's already zoned residential that could potentially be subdivided. Um, now that we've got a, an understanding of that, there's some work that we need to complete to look at what are the possible incentives that we could provide to make it easier or more appealing for homeowners to do those subdivisions and infill developments. <coughs> um, and when that work is completed, it'll be br brought back to the council for approval. Uh, that is one of the initiatives that was discussed at that workshop that isn't fully detailed in this report. Uh, we can provide more detail at the next meeting. Thank you, thank you. You don't have a timeline on that at this stage? Uh, no. Thank you. Um, uh, Deputy, Ma um, Deputy Mayor Kellen, would you like a action on that? The timeline? Well, the CE and the staff, I'm sh I, I have confidence that he'll bring it forward as soon as he possibly can. Acknowledged. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on page 101, uh, item 1.1, making things easier, um, it says investigate rates for mission options including first home builders and for residential conversion of town centre buildings and it says it's complete. This has been investigated by the finance team as not a viable option. I'm rather surprised at that. Can you frame <coughs> you put it into a question? Uh, so my question is why was that not a viable option especially uh, for residential conversion of town centre buildings? Chief Executive, David. Uh, through you, Chair, I don't think we've got staff in the room that are able to talk to this one. Uh, again, it is another initiative that we tabled at that workshop was to look at what incentive incentives we could provide for the conversion of um, uh, vacant office space into residential living spaces. Um, that work's still underway, so I'm a little bit surprised by that comment, and I need to talk to my team and get more detail. Thank you. That'll be excellent. Thank you very much. And who's in the Strategic Housing Investment Working Group? Is that all of staff who are involved in any which way of...? Uh, so uh, the Strategic Housing Investment Group is chaired by Councillor Kate and uh, includes a number of... Uh, Uh, there are some staff from within the council and then there are, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think, uh, there are some uh, planners and building developers that are in that group. Oh yeah, thank you. Just, just, just. An architect too, maybe. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, did you want to clarify as chair? I don't know what the office was just told us is, is absolutely correct. 
Um, but I would point out that um, that group hasn't convened a meeting this training, just for your information. Okay. There's been other priorities that have taken up. Okay, it is referred to a bit uh, throughout this report. Uh, is it an action to take out in this meeting? Well, it, yeah, look, I, I, for example, on page 101, again, item 1.12, it says ongoing, work will be ongoing, work for the Strategic Housing Investment Working Group and, and includes a review of the RMA. So that's suggesting to me it's active, so I just think, uh, I think it's a really good idea to have a group like that. I'm just saying I'd like to see some, you know, clarification. I'll, I'll take an action to get the uh, chair yeah. to give you an overview of the timings and outcomes. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Thank you. That is are my questions. I appreciate it. Lots of work going on there. Thank you. Councillor Jolly. Through you, Mr Chair. Thanks, Lauren. Um, just regarding the Taupo Key site, is that up and running? I went past yesterday, I think it was, there was one tent and one little camper van there. Um, and are they behaving themselves at Anzac Parade campsite? Uh, so... Um Two parts to that answer. So Topol Key is not up and running in the way that uh, we expected it to be at this point. Uh, the toilet, the ablution block and the office block should be moved on site next week and then we will need the connections to power and uh, water for that to be underway. Um, but we've got security attending all of, uh, so the three sites, Topol Key, Anzac Parade and Springvale on a regular, well not regular, sorry, they are uh, attending at night at different times and uh, reporting back to me if there are any incidents and I've had one report since that started in March. Thank you. Thank you. And um, CE uh, Langford would like to add some notes. So through you, Chad, just to add some comments there and, and provide a little bit of explanation. Um, You'll all be appreciative that we're trying to stand something up relative, relatively quickly. Um, and now that the team have got into the detail of trying to get the site established, we've discovered a few, a few unexpected requirements around making sure that we've got the right kind of resource and building consents in place for the officers. Uh, our original plan to have off-the-shelf portacom style offices um, hasn't been possible because we need some um, non-standard uh, requirements being met um, which is required us to get building consents. We have had a look and, and I've been involved myself with the team to see whether we could expedite those processes but in the end we've made the call that as the regulator it's really important that council is seen to be doing things properly when we're giving resource consents and building consents to ourselves. So that's the primary reason why we're not up and running at this stage. But I think it's, um, it's critical to our integrity as a council that we do things by the book. Um, yeah, unfortunate. Hopefully you understand the explanation I've given. Thank you. Councillor Rob. Thank you. Um, the... Um, Strategy uh, item three, Wanganui's Homes meets the needs of our people, and 3.1 um, gives us a number of agencies, um, Kaungora, Kaungora, the Minister of Housing, Urban Development, and then 3.2 um, talks about the partnership with uh, Iwi, specifically Tupaho. Now, I... I I th these discussions, as you know, have been going on for many years. And are we any further ahead in partnerships with these organisations? Specifically, what is the aptitude of these organisations to provide more beds for vulnerable people in this community? Or is this just a, a monthly discussion? I just intervene there. I don't think it's the appropriate for um, council officers to give a, a view of their opinions. Can we rephrase, reframe, rephrase the question um, of communications that have happened and anything that they've said in particular? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. 
Uh, so the Whanganui Housing Governance Group has possibly only been in place uh, six months, and that's a, that's the CE, uh, Kind Order, and Tupahu have an agreement to work together on bringing the Kind Order homes into this community. So um, working the three organisations working together to ensure that the purchase of land that Kind Order are doing um, is uh, completely agreed by everyone in the group. So that that's a new group. There, some discussions have been had in the past, but actually that group's, uh, as I said, fairly new, six, I think six months. They've got a working group um, that uh, I was sitting on and currently um, uh, one of the housing advisors sits on that working group and they meet regularly to bring the information through to the governance group. Now, some of that work includes the 135 homes that Kind Order have on their work program currently, and a, a generally at each month there's a new uh, agreement for a new piece of land that they are looking at purchasing or looking at an agreement with. So they are constantly building their um, portfolio here. Just the build process is what's taking the longest point at this time. So uh, another question through you, um, uh, Mayor, um, Mayor, Chair, uh, Mr. Michael. Chair's fine. Um, <clears throat> just um, specifically, um, are there any developments that Wanganui District Council is in partnership in? Um, because it's been reported in the paper uh, that, um, for instance, uh, the two report of Tupaho. Uh, has uh, the Castle, Castle Street development was in partnership with the Wanganui District Council. There's been other reports mentioning the Wanganui, Wanganui District Council as part of this. But as I understand it, this council is not in partnership with anybody. Um, well, until last week, we were in partnership with Kind Water around the lease land that only just... Uh uh, came away at a meeting last week. So up until then, we've been working closely with them to try and get the lease land across the, the line so that we could, that, so that then Ministry of Housing and Urban Development could build homes on that land and we would have transitional housing there. So which is the leased land? So that's council, that's some of the council owned land that we had reviewed uh, probably 18 months ago. It, and it went to a workshop with council and you you uh, looked at some of the land that was appropriate and that land was put forward to kind order. Chief, Chief Executive David Langford would like to add some comments to that. Uh, so through you, Chair, look, you, you mentioned the Carson Street um, mm. development and I can confirm that we are in partnership on that project with Tupaho. Um, between us, we've got a, we had a successful application to the central government's infrastructure acceleration fund, which has provided um, quite a substantial amount of money so that council can put in the core infrastructure, roads, water pipes, wastewater pipes, that then enable Tupaho to, um, to build that development. That's, um, that, I think that's a really tangible uh, example of partnership and we're just in the process, I think, of finalising the developer agreements between Council and Tupaho with a view that then we're in a position for us to start planning for um, that core infrastructure to get put in place, the build process to start, that will then enable the housing build to follow. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, again, um, on page 104, item 3.8, work with others, including developers, to facilitate residential conversion of underutilised town centre buildings, and it says ongoing business as usual. I don't understand that's a resourced, Mr Chair, that that's a resourced position. That's just like a general, wouldn't it be great uh, that we could con that building owners convert buildings? So uh, would that be correct? It seems like it said, but can I have clarity? Uh, so that comment came from the planning team. Yeah. 
Yeah. Should we take an act? Action to get them yeah, I'd like real clarity in these yeah. reports as to if it's active. So that would be somebody actually knocking on the doors of building owners to say this is the way you could do it, hmm. as opposed to an opportunity comes along and of course they're going to mention it. Can I clarify though, you want action on this moving forward or would you like clarity on the subset of 3.8? Well, I think I think for this the purposes of this report, the report hmm. should be very clear on if it's active so that is somebody assigned to actually do that as a uh, proactive as opposed to well you know if the opportunity presents itself an officer will say well of course you know we would encourage conversion yep. they're two totally different things and i think in terms of clarity in these reports we need to know what we're resourcing and what we're not resourcing critique is noted thank you thank you very much appreciate that right. um, the other thing in the report i notice is that there are no dates when an initiative was started and and so for example, and I would I would quite like that. So and, and the budget that we've set aside to, for clarity in terms of these reports. When I look at item, for example, 4.2, page 104, you know, uh, the 83 Telpo key is underway, but there's no indication of when that was initiated. Mm. And so as time goes on, I, I, it's turning into a comment. So I, yeah, I so guess it's critique why is can't we have those? Sorry, could we have those Mayor, dates, sorry. Mr. Chair? Um, Critique is granted, I'll take that offline if I can. Can I ref rephrase that into a question of... Yeah. So could we have dates when, when things are initiated? Yep. And then, and then if there's updates, you know, a date's put in, would that be possible within this report? Chief Executive David Langford. Um, through you, Chair, um, short answer to that is yes, we can look at the reformatting and the content of the report. I'm happy to discuss that offline because it's not really a, a question of a clarification for the content of the report right now. Going back to your previous one, though, I can confirm that that is not an active resourced role where we have a planner or going and knocking on people's doors and actively uh, inviting building conversion. It is more we're, um, we're open for business and where where uh, a building owner comes to us, they get a, a friendly welcome and we do whatever we can to try and help them through our processes to get the consents they'd need. Thank you. And last point for clarification, please. How many staff do we have dedicated to the housing strategy in terms of that's their primary role? Who has the answer? <laughs> uh, through you, uh, Chair, two. two. Sorry, what did you say? I don't quite hear Is that. Is it two FTE or two people? Uh, sorry, uh, two people. Lauren, can you confirm? Is that two full FTE? Or? Yes, that is two full FTE. Two full FTEs. Yeah. Oh, okay. And a bit of me. Okay. Sorry? And a bit of me. And a bit of you. Yeah, okay. I wasn't sure if you were doing it all, so I just wanted to clarify no. that. Thank you. That's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you very much, and thank you for questions and clarifications. The officer's recommendation. Oh, oh. hi, Josh. Okay, a bit early on the budget. Um, officer's recommendation is that the Operations and Performance Committee receive the report, housing strategy update. Can I have a mover for the motion? Josh, can I have a seconder for the motion? Kate, Councillor Kate, apologies. Um, is there any amendments required? No, thank you. And we'll move into comments. Josh was hot off the mark. So Josh, Councillor Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Lauren, for the um, report. I just want to make a, a, a brief comment on item, or sorry, point number 1.1 1 .1, um, in relation to the rates remission options. And I may be a bit premature here, but um, I just want to really caution us against moving down this path at this point. I'm happy to receive more information if it, um, if it comes to light, but just want to emphasise that this, for me, is an equity issue, and um, we can't forget that if we grant remission to one property owner, regardless of whether it's a new build or an existing one, um, the money doesn't just magically source itself from somewhere else. Someone has to pay, so there's ultimately a redistribution here, and I think it's really important that we... Um, that we bear that in mind. The the other thing is that you know if a if a property owner is undertaking a, a you know a, a million dollar redevelopment or a or a significant build, 
I do question whether a few thousand dollars for a, for a temporary period of time is actually going to act as the incentive that we need to encourage additional builds and additional supply. So I really question the, the validity of moving down this path and would rather that long term we look at incentives around making sure that the subdivision process is as easy as possible, that we have freely available information to, um, to, to ensure that a, a potential developer um, has that access and um, is able to go through as a, as a simple process as possible, really. So, so yeah, just wanted to use the opportunity to, to highlight my um, scepticism of that particular um, option as a, as a useful one for us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Josh. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Um, thanks for the report and all the good work, Lauren. I think, um, I think, from what I've heard of the discussion this afternoon, um, there is a bit of a feeling that this work stream um, might lack some clarity in terms of what priorities are and what um, what. Yeah, what is important and what is not. I would say to you that uh, being relatively close to this work um, is that the amount of resource and energy that has been soaked up or sucked out of the resource that we have at Council in terms of dealing with homelessness and um, you know the initiative down on the quay has been huge. And the strategy the, the bigger pieces of work, the long-term pieces of work, have um, necessarily languished because of that. A simple, yeah, the, the simple um, matter is we have not had enough resource um, invested into what we are um, wanting to achieve here. Um, and I'd also suggest that, that sometimes when we're doing something a bit new, um, it takes a while for, to to develop a whole of organisation approach to that. Um, so yeah, I, ju I just want to um, mihi to the work that's happening in in Lauren's team um, in this space, and that should this report should no way in. Um, I'm trying to find the right words. Um, yeah, is, doesn't really reflect all of it. Thank you, Councillor Kate. Councillor, sorry, Deputy uh, Mayor Helen. Thank you. I do appreciate everybody using my title. I do enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Just have to say it. Uh, makes me feel good. I'm wanted, I'm loved, finally. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Um, Look, thank you, and I know I posed quite a lot of questions, um, and I think this is a, such an important report uh, because it's such a big issue for our community, and so clarity in it will really help us understand what real progress we are making. I am pleased to hear that we've got two full-time FTEs. I was a wee bit worried that it was just Lauren uh, and everything else she has to do, so that is good news. Um, I, as I already said, I would like some more precision in the report because uh, that will give us clarity to what we're actually doing and working on uh, and, and know where we've got some problems that we need to perhaps uh, address in other ways. Uh, one item uh, that is called 1.1 where it talks about a rates holiday, uh, not a holiday, it talks about rates for emissions. Uh, and it's uh, somebody else mentioned, another councillor mentioned that maybe they, that wasn't uh, very good. Actually, they have been, uh, they are used in other councils uh, for particularly with heritage uh, to encourage building owners to do the work they need to do to earthquake strengthen and turn into apartments. So there's really good evidence in that, and it usually works from the time they start construction to the time that they are. Uh, they will get a rates holiday for it's usually around five years and that is actually a huge incentive and is very very powerful and for most of the developers there is no money in developing these buildings and and it just gives them that bit of financial relief uh, that 
helps encourage them along with other things to, to actually do the work. And the result, of course, is once you have a fully refurbished building, it is paying much higher rates than it was as either an empty building or semi-derelict or whatever. So there's, it, you actually get your money back council-wise. So I'm really looking forward to some more work being done there, and it has been languishing. We've talked about this in the past, and it needs, that's a key bit of work. Uh, 2.4 refers to, in the paper, refers to the Earthquake Prone Buildings Task Force uh, is no longer operating, and therefore that um, uh, uh, that means that the, 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 the team have to do a little bit more work. Can I suggest that the Earthquake Prone Buildings Task Force can be reinstated if it, there's a clear purpose for it? It was a very good uh, committee, subcommittee, and I was on that, and we had not only officers involved in the building sector, but we had architects, we had developers, we had real estate agents, and it was a very good thing to be a group that was brought together to make submissions to the government on earthquake-prone buildings. It just needs to have a clear purpose, and we'd be happy to get that back up and running. Uh, item 1.12 talks about advocating to central government uh, for legislative changes. Uh, can I already advise that the CE, the Mayor and myself have been talking about that actively and there's an active study underway collecting information that we can advocate to the government, especially around the earthquake prone bill, uh, the Heritage Equip Fund, which is that government incentive fund. We want that back in place and you will know, know that the Zone 3 Committee of Mayors have already made that agreement to Central to LGNZ that we want the Heritage Equip Fund reinstated. So there just needs to be a little bit joining up between this this paper and what uh, the Mayor and the CE are doing. I think, again, it's about robustness, about what's on the report and who's doing what. Um, and I am a bit concerned, uh, look, 4.2, which talks about the... Uh, the uh, the homelessness, the uh, project 83, at 83 Te Uh that was initiated quite some time ago of creating that new site, and I can't remember the exact date, and there was a promise that that would get set up really, really quickly, you know, and it hasn't happened, and I understand all the reasons why, but I think in terms of reality of saying, yes, we can move everybody down there, and make something happen real fast, and then the reality of actually having to abide by all the rules and regulations and source uh, buildings, etc., that everybody else is fighting over too, the two different things. So I guess it's just about uh, the organisation understanding reality rather than want, and that's us too, that's on us too. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just a comment in terms of, of, of that, and dates would help for us to understand the lag time uh, that's happening. But thank you for the staff. I do really appreciate all the hard work. I know it's a difficult environment and it's really good to see the strategy um, being implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Helen. Uh, Councillor Rob. Thank you, um, Chair Michael. Um, I, look, I, I wanted to also comment further on 4.2 uh, as Councillor he Deputy Mayor Helen has just said. Um, first of all, you know, we all went into this election back in October knowing that probably the number one issue that we had around here was housing and specifically we, the, the situation at Anzac Parade was high on people's agenda and I think everybody recognised that. You know, and here we are eight months later and we haven't improved the situation one little bit you know and we had these plans for uh, 83 Taupo Key now um what's so different why do these people need an office why are we delaying this because we hear that well we can't get the toilets and we can't get the office they don't need an office but they need some toilets and I fail to understand why it takes so such a long period of time to get some toilets on site. Builders do it all the time. Now, and so, quite frankly, I, I mean, I know there's people working hard on this issue, but we're not getting a result. 
No, and uh, quite frankly, I'm tired of explaining to the public and defending the actions of council over this issue. So please, Chief Executive, can this be done in the next month? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make com comment myself. Uh, thank you for everyone's comments on that and thank you for the robust report that we have received. Um, a lot of the feelings in this committee, you could... Oh, sorry, Glenda. <laughs> Councillor Glenda. Through the chair, thank you. All it's all good. good, it's all good. Um, I'd just like to thank um, you, Lauren, and the team for your report. Uh, a lot of hard work in here. I just want to um, acknowledge that. And in particular, um, um, just following on from my colleague across the across the way there, um, with 4.2, I, um, I understand personally what it's like to get resource consents, and it's, n it's never in five minutes. So uh, while we were wanting um, this to be to happen straight away, and everybody wanted this to happen straight away, the reality that our CE did uh, comment on earlier was that we needed to go down this um, path of getting the appropriate consents to be able to have this um, to happen. And yes, it has taken longer than we would have hoped, but again, as our CE, CE has commented, we need to be seen to be leading and to be doing the right thing. So unfortunately, that's, that's the case. Um, the officers, I thought, were for um, support people that were going to be going in and supporting the people that were there. So um, great work. We all are really looking forward to seeing this happen and it will be a great day when we can go down and visit the people down there. So once again, thank you for this report. Really appreciate it. Good work. And Councillor Genda said exactly what I was going to say. Um, there are barriers to councils and we all know that. And we, 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 have, we do move slower than a private organisation because we have regulations. But I do very much appreciate the work that's been done. And remember to quote Mayor Andrew, this is stage one. We've got a long way to go on this whole thing. And the reason why it may feel like critique on this report is because everyone's so passionate about this report. So I think this look at it as a continuous improvement as opposed to critique. And you know, I think this is a really good report. So thank you very much for that. Um, I put the motion on the screen that the Operations and Performance Committee received the report, Housing Strategy Update. All in favour? All against? Carried. Thank you. Item number 5.9, Horizons Regional Council Passenger Transport Committee Update, June 2023. Um, this is an update on the activities of Horizons uh, Passenger Transport Committee. Um, Wanganui District Council's representative to the Horizons Passenger Transport Committee, Anthony Tonin, will be joining us. Hi, Anthony. Tēnā koutia and uh, tēnā koutou katoa. It's uh, great to be here again. Um, and I think this is my first report to this council um, as your member on the Passenger Transport Committee at Horizons who set the direction of public transport in the region. Um, I've been doing this since 2019 and in that time there's been a consensus on the committee to evolve and grow the role of public transport in Horizons. Um, and we can see that in our new regional public transport plan, which has an ambition to make public transport attractive to everyone, including people who have a car. And that's a big change. A more tangible change will be the new Palmerston North bus network, which has been tendered and will start early next year. It's seven routes running 15 to 30 minute frequencies, seven days a week, um, and it will be New Zealand's first all electric bus fleet. This is a really positive thing for um, the region and it bodes well for public transport. It does also underline the distance we have to travel um, to catch up to the level of investment. So with our recent improvements, uh, Wanganui spends $41 per person per year on public transport. Palmerston North spends $124. And remembering that Wakakotahi pay half um, after fares. So that means that central government contribution to a person in Palmerston North is three times the amount of what it is in Wanganui. This is something that's built up over the time and it's been something that we addressed in our regional public transport plan. Um, so for example, in 1990, Palmerston North and Wanganui had equal amounts of ridership. Um, because of differences in investment, 
Um, Palmerston North now has 50% more ridership than 1990. We have one quarter. So um, this is something that we've been working on, and Tengaru the Tide, our collaboration with Horizons, has been a first step. It's a trial of a ridership-focused service. So a ridership-focused service is designed to reach as many people as possible. It does that with direct and frequent um, routes, which run long periods of the day. We have a long history with ridership, of course, and we have good population density on our old tram corridors that give us a geographical advantage. But for the last 30 years, we've only run coverage routes. So coverage routes use a small number of buses to reach as wide a spread as possible. And they do have a value, but they don't have the potential to have high numbers of riders. So Te Ngaru is a chance for us to see if we can bring back that ridership approach. And the numbers have been very strong. So looking at March to May this year compared to last year, um, we've seen 33,000 um, urban bus trips as compared to 18,000 last year. So that's an 80% increase. But remembering the tide only goes on one route. So it's more interesting to look at the corridor it travels along. Last year we had three services on that route, um, totaling 10,000 trips. So in the last three months, we've had 23,000 trips on that corridor. So it shows that we have more demand than what we've been supplying for in the coverage model. Um, something else pleasing about the tide, though, has been um, the growth in operational capacity. So Transit have hired 20 new drivers. Um, they've got very high quality Euro 6 buses. Um, we've seen a huge increase in marketing from Horizons um, and capability. We've seen things like the real-time transit app and the region's first real-time information board. We've also attracted central government funding with this project. So having the tide about to start as part of our case for Streets for People funding um, on St Hill Street has also given us $1.2 million from the Transport Choices Fund to um, introduce real-time signage um, at 15 locations around the city, including places where the tide doesn't run. So, Looking to the future, there's potential that we can use this growth in capacity and knowledge um, to implement a ridership network. The, the biggest gains from a ridership approach come when you try to achieve the network effect, where you get more ridership than the sum of any individual route. And this is achieved by having more than one frequent route um, and some coverage routes that integrate really well so that people can transfer and get from anywhere to anywhere on the network. A good public transport network is not just about the urban system, it's also about the regional connections. And so I wanted to mention that Horizons are now coming to consultation um, on a regional review. And this is an opportunity um, that we can look to build a regional network for the lower North Island so that someone can get anywhere to anywhere else without their car. And there's great interest and headwinds in this because we have interest from Greater Wellington, from Taranaki, and from Waikato um, in connecting into regional routes that cross uh, boundaries. W one thing I, I would note, a, a hole in our system, is that it is currently um, impractical, if not impossible, to do a same-day return trip to Wellington without your car. But if we had a bus service that went to Waikanae Station via Foxton rather than Palmerston North, be possible to travel to Wellington by bus and train um, in about three hours. Quick note on deadlines and things. So um, Horizons are starting to put pencils in their long-term plan um, at the moment. So if we want improvements to the urban network or um, the regional network, the time to advocate for those is now. It's also a regional land transport plan year. And some of you may remember that uh, Wanganui didn't receive a lot in our regional land transport plan last time. Um, this is the time to get uh, projects or wording into that plan. And acknowledging as well that we have a lot of infrastructure work to do to support the bus network, things like a Jury Hill elevator uh, bus stop, which isn't po possible at the moment with the roading layout. And I thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I'll open the floor up to questions and clarification. Councillor Glenda. Thank you, through your chair. Thank you for, the, for your report. Um, two, I've got two questions. The first one is um, to the left, the tide determinus future. Is that out at the beach? Um, well, that's an open question. So definitely the largest part of um, feedback that we've had so far is from 
people actually on the outer mall side um, wanting to see the tide extended to the end of the current outer mall routes. Um, so certainly when we come to renewal of the tide um, next June, uh, we could look to um, go out there. That would also give us the opportunity to lose some duplication. The purple and orange routes currently go out to there. Um, we've also had some um, comments from the Council Cliff end as well that they'd like to see it reach the terminus at Waitorte Street. To be able to do this trial, we had to um, make some compromises, and one of them was the length of the route. Thank you. And my other question is, um, could we please consider the Hedge Road um, as being um, part of the route to be able to, because there's a, there's a lot of employees out there, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that they would be really appreciative of having, um, being able to use the bus to get to work and back as well. So, mm -hmm. Councillor Glendo, is that a action you would like? Yes, please. <coughs> It's a, it's a really, really good question. There's always a trade-off when you're um, working with public transport. Um, if you create more than one route, you have the, the frequency that you can offer it at. Um, so the important thing is to choose the right route and try to run as much frequency as you can. Um, there's definitely merit in looking at Heads Road. And if we were able to zoom out and take a full network approach, um, which, we, which we weren't able to do this because it was a trial of a specific kind of public transport, um, I think it would be really good to run the numbers and, and to look really closely um, which is the ideal corridor to be using. Mm. Sure, thank you. Councillor Charlotte. Thank you, through you, Chair. Um, I guess the significant investment that Palmerston North has made is quite recent, um, and I think you sort of covered this. It wasn't really in your report, but you... Um, so there's been a significant jump in the council's level of investment um, recently. So have you got any ideas of how you think that Whanganui can catch up with that level of investment that Palmerston North has? Well, it's quite difficult because um, this is a problem that's developed incrementally and it's very hard to solve when you've set up to increasing budgets incrementally. Um, so. Uh, one of the advantages with the tide, when we first brought it to Horizons, there wasn't an interest because of the level of cost. Um, similar thing happened for Queenstown when they went to um, create a new network in 2017. Um, they just couldn't get the budget to implement the kind of network which would achieve high ridership. Um, our approach was Queenstown's approach as well, was every dollar that you um, input from the district council end results in four dollars because it gets matched by the... Um, by the regional council, but then it gets matched again by Waka Kotahi. Mm. And remembering the national average for per capita public transport investment, including a 50% Waka Kotahi share, um, is $150 per person. So Palmerston North has always been above us in the last 30 years, mm. um, but they're now moving um, to 124, so still under the national average. Right. In Wellington, um, the average person has a contribution um, has an investment um, from their council and their government um, of over $300 per person wow. in public transport. That puts that into perspective. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Rob. Mm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, um, well done on, on your contribution to this. Um, those who um, uh, have had uh, experience with um, um, on, on the uh, committees with Anthony will know the value that we're getting uh, from Anthony for this community. It's incredible. Um, and um, I'd just like to ask about the the tide and can you just comment on whether you see there needs to be things like maybe an extension of the service at either end or some changes and I know that you've got you've got an opinion about the timetable running in early and things like that. So I'd just like to get your views about that put to this, this group. Yeah, um, I think it makes sense to go from end to end, particularly because um, if we don't go from end to end, we'll need to retain two other bus routes which, which go on the same route. Um, and it's more coherent and you can plan routes much better if you use one bus route. Um, and you make it more frequent. Um, for example, we've got a problem at the moment with the 202. Um, it's currently running about three minutes behind 
the tide. So <coughs> because they're not equally spaced, you don't have the opportunity um, to allow them to pick up different groups of people. Mm -hmm. um, that's inevitable when you have different routes um, running on the same area, but they have devi different deviations. So there will be places where they don't line up so well in average timing. And definitely we've found, um, in terms of our cost estimate for the tide, it was largely, a part of it was based on how long we thought it would take to do the tide route in a bus. It turns out we're actually getting through that route with our drivers a little bit faster than we expected. Um, it does look likely that before we come to review um, in June next year, we will be able to adjust the timetable a little bit. It's really important going forward that we do make sure the bus goes through its route as quickly as possible because that always means it will cost us less and it will mean we're able to um, create more frequency. One of the problems from our infrastructure side is that over time we've actually put a lot of bus stops, sometimes they're just as simple as an RP5 bus stop sign. Um, some of them are 100 to 200 metres apart. Um, national practice is at least 400 metres apart and starting to move towards 600 metres apart. Um, this is because particularly on a frequent route, um, once it starts to get popular, you will slow down the service a lot um, if you have a stop every 100 metres. Um, and that will mean it costs more and you can provide less frequency. And, and could you uh, comment also on the, the second route that you are, you've got in your, your report here, the Wanganui East to Springvale? Uh, where's, where are we heading with that? Well, that's a, potential, that's a potential option that we could look at. What this probably does need is a good piece of careful work to look at what a network would look like. Um, that's an illustrative example, um, and certainly <coughs> after the extension to Aramal, probably the next most common comment I've heard is from Wanganui East, who, because their routes um, go around in a circle and then meet at either end once they get off Anzac Parade, effectively most people have two hourly bus service in Wanganui East. Mm. So some of them haven't been super excited um, by, by the frequency um, going between Castlecliff and Aramal because it doesn't seem relevant to them. And saying that we are getting a um, real-time signage board in Wanganui East, so that helps to give us the potential of giving them more frequent service. Springvale is probably, so Wanganui East and Springvale are probably the best next contenders um, with, a, with a broad brush view for um, frequent service because what we've actually seen is as the tides come in, um, the use on the 202 which goes through Gonville has declined as people switch to the tide, but the route that goes from Castlecliff to the city via Springvale has actually increased. Yeah. Um, and so it's the second most used route at the moment. Um, uh, Chair Michael, I just have one final question um, of Anthony. And a lot in this community have, been, have commented about the, the tide service and they don't see anybody on the buses and things but I I, I think you know you've proved and, and they've proved that the the ridership is there um, but the other comment is uh, what's all this costing you know and and so I know that what we are putting into it as a council here roughly 180,000 I think into this trial so what is the what is the cost of the service? Are you uh, are you across that, Anthony? Yeah. So the cost of the service is just under a million dollars a year. Yeah. Yeah. And so we've been able to achieve that with a hundred and eighty thousand dollars in second and third year of the current long term plan. Um, and but to pull it off, we did have to start a little bit late. So it's a fifteen month trial. Um, mm -hmm. Again, looking at other regions around the country, our investment, our total investment is very low. Um, so it is worth saying that um, our investment d probably does need to keep increasing if we are to achieve more ridership. However, there's another factor to this. When you have a ridership network, um, it achieves much higher patronage, which brings you back <coughs> income and fares. Um, so it actually becomes more economically efficient. So the systems in the country that have the highest fare box recovery and, and cost the least for how many users they're using are ridership focused systems. So um, the benchmark is Queenstown's, um, which costs, when it went in in 2017, inflation has changed things a little bit now. Uh, so they've got a very affordable frequent network for $2.4 million. Um, 
they, just before COVID, they were achieving 1.5 million trips um, on that network, which meant that their subsidy per trip was $1.60. Um, so, and when we had the, uh, the short-lived private era in New Zealand in the 90s and 2000s, the services which survived um, were frequent ones, like the Dunedin um, St. Clair to Normanby service, which runs every 15 minutes. It survived as a private service where the council had to come in and save more coverage or the sorts of service because they were less economically efficient. Hmm. That's right. There's one final, final question. Is it, uh, is it quick, Councillor Rob? It's as quick as yes, because um, we have had a petition presented um, to this council and voted on it. Um, and um, you're aware of the petition I'm talking about, which is to change the bus route from Kings Ave to Bignall Street. Um, I'd like to, your opinion on making this change, please. Okay. Um, I, th I, think, I think it's a tough uh, one. I mean, Rob, I, I will allow this one. I, I would refrain from opinion questions if I can. You were meant to be asking for clarification on the report. Is that okay, okay for next time? No, this is a this is an expert we've got here. Yep. And we're getting an expert's opinion. But you're asking an opinion on an unrelated fact from this. No, it's not though. an unrelated fact at all. It's this is the, go we, we, this is the report of the governance group. Okay. This is the business of the governance group. Okay. I'm happy if I'm wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in public transport planning and in creating a good ridership-focused network, you do want the most direct route. You want it. You want the user. Um, to believe that they are on a route that they would have practically chosen in their car. Um, there are trade-offs with, with coverage and, and, um, and other things to be considered as well. And so that was the rationale from uh, Horizons, and I can certainly understand it. Um, and, and, you know, we've certainly, as a council, um, heard from, from this petition. Um, and there's, there's probably been some reasonable upset at the process from Horizons because they, they'd like to look at this um, very practically. Um, in saying all this, uh, in some ways my, my, my view here is irrelevant. I think that what we actually need to do is look at the whole network and that can help us to identify the absolute best corridors for these kinds of services um, and take a much more considered approach um, to implementing them. Um, I do know that there is probably further news to come on, on that. Um, so we can we can expect, and part of that comes from the fact that we've had such a voice. Normally, in the private era, when private services running public transport services, the public had no say on whether a bus went through um, the road network. Um, and if we weren't involved in this service as a funder, um, Horizons would probably take the same approach, and there wouldn't be much we could do. Um, and that. Their, it's within their planning right to put things on the place they, they see best. Um, but because we are a funder of this, we've had quite a strong voice in this, um, and it's, um, I think there'll be more news on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rob. Uh, I have one simple question. Um, regarding the funding from Waka to Kotahi, um, you mentioned that it's investment-driven. Does that mean that if uh, it's not user-based, i.e. if we paid for it, we would uh, still receive the same funding? Or does that make things complex? So what you're asking is, um, Waikotai is not funding us on how many people are using the bus, they're funding it, yeah, it's, an, it's investment based. So um, a regional council goes to Waikotai and says, we have a case to invest this much in a new network, um, will you um, co-fund this with your usual 51%? Awesome. Thank you for your questions. Um, officer recommendation is that the Operations and Performance Committee receive the report, Horizons Regional Council Passenger Transport Committee update, June 2023. Can I have a mover, please? Glenda, thank you. And Councillor Kate is seconding? Yes. Thank you very much. Is there any um, comments? Oh, a few. Councillor Charlotte. Thank you, through you, Chair. Uh, I just want to thank you, uh, Anthony, for all that you do for Wanganui. Um, it was a fantastic report, very thorough, and um, congratulations on a very thorough presentation. Very good, thank you. Mayor Andrew. 
Uh, yeah, look around the table, Anthony. So um, I'd echo those thoughts. Um, we're actually very lucky to have you. I've got to know you quite well over the last few months, and um, uh, I, um, I uh, value your opinion and your, your perspective on, on uh, these matters. And um, I also really uh, um, value your opinion about um, and, and your perspective around widening just the Whanganui perspective. I've talked a lot about uh, um, taking Whanganui to New Zealand and to the world and how we get people in and out, people and products in and out of Whanganui. And so your reference in the document here uh, around uh, getting uh, you know, getting to Wellington in three hours without using public transport, but you've also, I've seen your little map that takes us up to Auckland as well. Uh, so um, I think it's, it's fantastic that you're thinking just beyond Whanganui and, uh, and you've got... Um, you know, you've got that, that perspective, so hopefully there's more to come. Thank you. Councillor Rob? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I um, spent a very interesting couple of hours with Anthony a, a couple of weeks ago riding the tide, so to speak. And I, I, I have to say that it was quite enlightening for me because I was converted in those two hours, to be honest. And while I was um, really sceptical, and I do sympathise with the public because there's no doubt about it that the, there doesn't seem to be very many passengers on these buses when they're going past all the time. But I'm really confident in those figures. And when you analyse them and see them properly explained, this service is being picked up very well. You know, and it's pretty obvious that frequency is a real key thing in a passenger transport system. And, and I raised that issue before about the second route because it became very obvious to me in that two hours I spent with, with, with Anthony that that second route from Wanganui East to Springvale would be a fantastic addition to a high frequency service. In fact, I would go as far to say is that is Wanganui's public transport system. Why do we need a bus coming along Oakland Avenue every three hours? What's the point? You know, they all just drive around. Nobody ever gets on a bus up in St. John's Hill that I can, I can see. Yet they come along and there's these three-hour frequencies all over town, and I hope that this trial will be so successful that we will, first of all, do another tide-type high-frequency service from Wanganui East to Springvale, and then maybe look at one other route from there. And then we'll have a great service for Wanganui. Thank you. Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chair. Um, th thank you for the report as well. I often observe that those who don't use the tide service quite often will criticise on social media with their analysis and their own version of data. And those who do use the tide, and I'm focusing on the tide, often don't compliment or comment on that same social media. So we don't get a true, we often do not get a true perspective as far as social media goes, so we do rely on your data. Um, I have used the Tide. It's great. There's only one problem. Me. <laughs> Getting into the habit. I drive a 2004 La Festa. It's a petrol pig. It's very expensive. And I'm still fighting my comfort zone to get out of my house, walk 200 metres, catch the Tide, and get on with my day. It does save me a lot of money. I do get into conversations with people, whether they like it or not, but um, it's, it's developing the habit. And, and I think that's something you can't control. It's up to the individual, and I will continue to get through what I understand is a six-week period where the brain needs six weeks to acquire a new habit and be in a comfort zone. I've got four weeks to go. I'll get there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ross. Mayor Andrew. Yeah, just one final comment. Is it's just uh, just for the record, um, 
my understanding is, and Anthony might want to correct me on this, that it's an 18 month or so uh, trial. And the reason for that is that it takes this amount of time to know, how, know, know the success or not. But what we're seeing already is that uh, despite some cynical perspectives in the first month or two when people were still discovering it, uh, that the increase in patronage has been quite significant. And so uh, I already see, if you extrapolate time, that this is going to be a success. And, uh, and so, but it typically takes an 18-month timeline to get a good understanding about whether it's successful or not. So, yeah. Councillor Joss. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chair, I'm wondering if, if we need a recommendation to make Councillor Rob Vincent the new public transport champion for the District Council oh. after a speech like that. <laughs> Um, Anthony, I just want to thank you for the for the report. As Councillor Charlotte has said, um, it's incredibly thorough, and it must have taken you a long time to put that together. So, just really want to acknowledge that. Um, and yeah, I mean, more more broadly, I think up until this point, we'll, we've almost been dealing with a with a chicken and egg situation, where on one hand, people don't support the investment because of the low uptake, and then on the other hand, people don't uptake because of the the, the lack of a frequent service. And I think we've broken that cycle. Um, by engaging in a in a, a trial of this sort, and um, the you know the stats um, speak for themselves, and yeah, just really looking forward to um, the outcome of the trial and investigating additional options around um, how we could increase the um, frequency of the route into more parts of Wanganui. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doss. Um, and from my point of view, um, I'm always happy to be wrong, and I think I mentioned here last month that uh, it looked like the tie was intersecting too much of the variance. And I reran the numbers. Um, the tie actually is increasing uh, and not decreasing the other routes quite far enough. So that's actually really good to see. And one of the things I'll, no one mentioned, I really want to point out that full fare adults overtook super, car, super gold card holders. So that's, that's really cool. That means people are actually paying for the service and not just using it because it's free. Um, I do, however, really want to push the idea that we only pay between 7 and 9 per cent of that fare, and do you want to go a little bit further, Council? Because if you go a bit further and we can have free public transport, and then we can work out, without the constriction of user pays, where is the best route to impact the most people, and with um, a new uh, chair of the Public Transport Committee to my left, um, yeah, it should be good. And I look forward to our two-hour um, the tide meeting we'll have apparently. Um, can I so, can I ask uh, for those in favour? Aye. Any against? That is carried. Thank you. Um, now we're only 106 minutes behind schedule. Um, yeah, definitely. It's, it's my fault. Uh, apologies for the slowness. Um, 5.10 is the financial committees. This is the new one that was added to the, to the list, late minute. October 2022, May 2023. Uh, by, and uh, we've got Chief Financial Officer Mike Fermore is going to present. No, he's not. Very good. Yeah. Uh, three, Chair. Uh, I'm going to present this one because Mr. Fermore is busy on other business and can't be here today. Um, so this is a, uh, a report that outlines all of the contracts that have been tendered and awarded over $200,000. The report is written in your book, uh, Diligent Books, goes back to October. Um, we have tabled some additional information which goes back through September and August as well so that you have complete coverage from uh, the the break just prior to the elections, so that all uh, contracts that have been awarded uh, from uh, I think the, the last meeting of the tenders board right the way through to um, uh, today are covered in the report in full. Um, you will notice uh, for some of you that are returning councillors, this is a very similar report to the one that you've received in the past. There are a couple of additional columns of information that have been added in. Uh, the most notable there is the, uh, the budget, um, just to give you an indication of how the actual costs compare to what was provisioned for, and also the methodology that was used during the tender uh, process. Um, just thinking if there's anything else I need to add in here. No, at this point, I think I'll 
pause there and take questions. Awesome. We move into questions and clarifications. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Helen Gregg. Thank you. Thank you for the report. Um, through the chair, the Davis Library extension, it says that the design work included within a 300,000 budget line, and then it says that the total awarded price is 144,000. What was the budget for the actual build cost, and have we actually got that in our budget, or was that within the 300,000? So through you, Chair, um, I'll need to just go and double check and confirm offline, but my understanding is we have current budget for the design work, the budget for the build cost sits in future years in the long-term plan, uh, which years and how much, I can't remember off the top of my head, but okay. happy to take an action to confirm. Thank you, thank you. Um, who determines the budgets for the design work? Is that something that internally is done? Because we wouldn't, at a councillor level, we wouldn't normally agree that. Or is that just uh, part of the normal a annual plan that we would sort of see that that item was in there and approve it? So through you, Chair, it's, it's actually a little bit of uh, a mixture. So, for example, where we have a budget for, like the Davis Library, that runs over the course of several years, there may be a budget put in the, annu uh, in the LTP in a given year for the design only. Um, but more commonly, where a project's delivered in its entirety, there's just a gross budget for the whole project, and then it is um, uh, part of management's responsibility is we build up those budgets to make sure there's a, a sensible provision for the design component of the project. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of the Pukunami Queen's Park, the landscape design is stated at $500,000. Now that was a lot more than I think we ever contemplated as, as a councillor body. Uh, and I'm and I'm not sure that we've even got any budget to implement that plan. So I see the plan was let out at 425,000. Can you comment on that, please? Uh, yes, I can, and, and I may just go into a little bit of detail here because this is one that I've, um, uh, at, at your previous request, taken a little bit of a deep dive into offline. So, um, first of all, uh, this piece of work is actually, I think, a, a longer term project that is not just a single uh, bit of landscaping work, and it's got its roots in the reserve management plan for Pukenama Gardens. When you look at um, the size of Pukenama Gardens and the scope of work that's been defined in the in the uh, reserve and management plan, we are talking a significant project. And to use some kind of industry standard kind of um, cost per square meter, cost per hectare for landscaping works, and you benchmark the size of this park against other projects that have been delivered by other councils, my expectation would be that to do um, uh, uh, not even a, you know, not a gold-plated, but not a basic project here, you are looking at a budget that should be of the order of five to six million dollars in mm. today's money. Um, simply because you've got a seven hectare park, even you deduct the, the footprint for the buildings and other things, it's still of the order of five hectares of landscaping works. I don't think the intention, reading the LTP and reading the reserves management plan, was for it to be a, a, a design and build project, but more a long-term master plan for Pukunamu Gardens that could then be picked off in stages over an extended period of time. Um, none of that appears to have been adequately budgeted for. Um, we've also scrutinized the cost for the design work, and again, comparing it against industry standards, um, I'll just refer to my notes here, uh, the New Zealand Institute of Landscape Architects, their guidance is that typically design work for these kind of projects should represent circa um, six to 16% of the total budget. Uh, and on that basis, 
um, the price that we've got for the design work kind of falls very nicely into the middle of that range. So I think the price we've got from the market is a fair reflection of the scope of work we've asked for. The issue here is have we really truly understood the scale and magnitude of this project before we've started to commit ourselves to it in the long-term plan? Thank you. So will we end up with a very detailed plan for 425000 Yes, through you, Chair, um, very much so. One of the points that I would highlight there is the, um, the, the price for that bid includes a number of provisional sums for, <coughs> excuse me, for a extra services. One of those is an, a, about a $70,000 allowance for detailed civil engineering. So if we need any structures, a retaining wall building as part of the, um, the landscaping concept plan, there's an option there for us to get the detailed civil engineering design work done within the, the price of this contract. It is an option. We don't have to use it if we don't want to. And it isn't something we originally asked for as part of the scope of the project. Um, so it is also one thing to highlight when you're comparing the, the price range. That's an extra added value um, offering from this particular supply that isn't included in the prices from the other bidders. Um, so it does mean comparing the prices, you're not looking at apples with apples on paper only. You need to do a little bit of work to back out those additional uh, offerings that have been put forward. But to answer your question, yes, it takes you through to pretty much a detailed design phase for everything apart from an electrical design for the lighting of the park. So there's no electrical design for the lighting of the park, so there's no lighting within that plan? So it gives you um, what is included, and again, this is in addition to what was asked for in the scope of the bid. It gives you a lighting strategy and a concept for the lighting, but it doesn't give you the electrical engineering design. But none of the prices offered did because it wasn't something we asked for. It's uh, a provisional sum and a, an additional um, offering from this particular bidder if we choose to take it up. Thank you. And within the scope of this, it's supposed to be extensive public consultation, including with our area, is that correct? Uh, through you, Chair, yes, that's correct. And when will that start, and when will, it, when will we have the plan in our hands? Uh, so through you, Chair, the work has already started, um, and I'm just looking to the team in terms of uh, an approximate ETA, please. October, November. Okay, thank you. And the Sergeant Gallery is hoped to open sometime mid-year, I think. So my, I guess, is in terms of implementing what might ever be in the plan, in time, and it won't be the whole scope of it, but in time for the Sergeant Gallery to open, how is this dovetailing? So um, through you, Chair, there's a lot of work going on um, in terms of developing the concept, but uh, the team are working alongside the Sergeant Gallery project. We're also liaising with the Sergeant Gallery Trust. Uh, the, the priority is to focus any of the early implementation to the immediate surrounds of the building so that you have uh, a landscape that complements the new building ready for the opening. Okay, and just for clarity, and I, I, I'm sorry to belabor this, uh, and I know this is about awarding a contract, but it's understanding the scope of it in terms of what we got underway. Uh, I don't think that we've got any other money in the budget for capital works in terms of implementing the plan at the moment. So my question is, have we? Uh, either from this, because I thought it was within the 500, or, or is it under the Sergeant Gallery budget? Uh, three, Chair. I'm going to reserve the right to take that question offline and just make sure I've got my facts before I give you an answer on that. I think there's, there's a combination of a little bit of funding available plus through the project itself, but I want to talk to the team. I'll give you a, a confirmed answer via email afterwards if that's okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, the Premier Parks maintenance budget, is that for how many years? Councillor Jennings, do you have the answer? No. 
three years, isn't it? So. Uh, Two point eight million. I'm just wondering how many years it is because it's not up there. Through you, Chair, our Parks Manager has just left the room, <laughs> uh, and I don't have the answer to that, I'm afraid. Okay, because we just have that sort of clarity taken. in report, because it's yeah. quite important, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and the CBD maintenance, it looks like it's only been awarded for six months. I can't quite figure that out. What's that? Uh, through you, Chair, I think that is um, a reflection of the fact that the contract is a, is a long-term maintenance contract that spans multiple years. The price there reflects the um, because we're awarding it part way through a year, it reflects the cost of the part year, not the full year, is my interpretation of that. Could you get clarity on that? Because that's yes. not clear to me at yep. all. So, and I presume it's been real, oh, it's the main street one, I know, but yeah, if you could clarify that, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at a very recent meeting, uh, it's seven years, but there's a policy change that's about to change to nine years, three by three by three. So, um, so, okay, three, this, uh, so, so one of this those two. offline, if we can, sure. due to time. Councillor Rob, question? Yeah. This sort of probity that's going on here is exactly what used to happen at the tenders board. And I, I want people to take notice of that. You know, now, um, I, so normally you would have asked these, these ask questions would have been answered quite quickly in a, with the documents that are provided at the tenders board meeting by the, the officers. Now we're forced into making these questions here and getting explanations Apologies, about Rob, these can contracts. Apologies, please. Now, so I want to first of all talk about contracts. Can I ask a question, please, Rob? I am. I know, but... Just be quiet. If we could... Start a question with what, how, if, when, in what way, yeah. to be concise. Thank so, you. So, contract number 2020, we accepted the highest tender. Why did we accept the highest tender? Can, can CE answer that? We accepted the highest tender because after the price quality tender evaluation, they had the best bid. Okay. Um, and uh, the velodrome track replacement, 2014, New Zealand dollar 992,540. This is this is this is not the only contract, is it? Because this is a two and a half million dollar job. I believe there was one tender received. Is that correct, CE? Uh, yes, um, I think you're maybe misreading that it is the um, 731,000 euros plus 992,000 New Zealand dollars. Uh, we do have the project manager in the room, so we can get further clarification if you'd like. Rosemary. Can I just request then uh, that in future that we don't get foreign currencies like that on this report? It's very confusing. Um, the request request uh, noted. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, the and, and as it was already um, talked about before, there's some questions to be asked, and they have been asked about CBD maintenance contract. I understood that was uh, an interim uh, contract. Um, and the, uh, also the, 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 the tenure of this contract for um, 1983, the, the Premier Parks, um, is that a per, per annum cost or is it a, a year, some sort of period? And I know it was yeah. great so, before. Uh, three, three year chair, but I think I already said the, um, the CBD maintenance is for a part year. We do have um, our uh, property in place as general manager back in the room now, so she can provide some okay. confirmation and then also confirm the duration, the term of the Premier Parks contract. Sarah. Sarah, can you clarify that question for us, please? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so the CBD maintenance contract uh, went out for um, out to the market for the first time. Um, the the contract had previously been held by Main Street and had never been tendered um, mm. in the public domain before. So we took that out to the market last year and we got two um, tenders. Uh, and the preferred tender um, was awarded to Main Street. Um, the price increase um, came through ahead of the annual plan process, and we've we've dropped the additional funding into the annual plan that that we adopted or that you adopted um, earlier this week. So that um, went through a, a rigorous market test for the first time ever. Um, Sarah, sorry. Uh, the 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 contract. Sorry. sorry. Could you just confirm the the six months six month contract, please? Um, and the Premier Parks, I can't speak to the duration of that because um, I just can't remember how long it goes for. Sorry, I need to um, find that out. Can we have an action on that, Sarah? Is I that think okay? the question was, is a budget of 2.8 million, is that one year? Uh, uh, I, I doubt it very much. <coughs> yeah. yeah, I just don't know what the duration is. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. So I can, I can confirm that it's the gross tendered value of the whole contract. It's not the annual value. No, but we just don't know how many years it's covering. Rob, does that suffice for the moment? And we get action to clarify. Uh, it, it just confirms me to me that what I raised before about this process. That's all. Thank you. C can I? Uh, so, so I've just had a memory um, is recall. It, is it answering the question? The the question around the Rob's question. Sorry, no, not that. Uh, the, the question around the duration of the Premier Park. Yep. Um, we presented a paper to council last year. Uh, it was before the election um, around um, going to, so you approved the procurement plan for for that um, that contract. That's right. It's just okay. clarity. Excuse thank, me, Mr Chair. Thank you. Do you have one last quick question? Uh, yes. Uh, we haven't had it answered. The, the 320000 for the CBD maintenance contract, under that it's got six months. So it's a six months contract, three hundred twenty thousand, or it's the annual contract, three twenty, but you're only doing it for six months. It's just not clear. Okay. Yep. Cool. Thank you very much. Sorry. I have no. a question too, but I'm a nameless person. Oh, where are you? I don't know. I might be presenter or. or oh, your senior staff. officer. Senior officer. Okay, we'll go senior officer Jenny first, uh, and then back to you, Helen. That's okay. And apparently, my light comes on automatically. It does. So <laughs> I, am, I am extremely advantaged, but didn't realise it. Quick question, and it is probably directly to 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 David. The landscape plan for Pukenama Queens Park is that coming to us for approval, or is it just going to be actioned? Uh, through you, Chair, it's it's already actioned, and the work is underway. No, no. The the plan, when it is oh, complete, yes. will the plan come to us before it is actioned? Uh, through you, Chair. Um, yes, it'll come to council. You got an estimated like like October, November, or what? Uh, yeah, once the work's yeah. complete. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Helen. Thank you. Um, th so this is a question for the CE through you, Mr. Chair. Um, what is the mechanism to refer uh, a potential contract back? To council, should the budget be way over what we contemplated? And I'm looking directly at Pukenami Queens Park because at a five hundred thousand dollars, I believe that exceeded uh, four twenty five was awarded exceeded what we would have contemplated for a cost of a design contract, no matter who delivers it. Is, this a is there policy any question, mechanism mm -hmm. for staff to say, oh, this is possibly beyond what? Council contemplated, and we'll bring it back for double check. Chief Executive David, is there a? What I'm hearing from my colleagues is that the column that says budget is not correct. Is that what you're meaning to say, Helen? Because that whole corridor of what you've just said says you don't believe the budget item. Correct. To, so to clarify that, I think that well, and certainly in my in my memory, the five hundred thousand was a, a, an amount set aside that would and that would be for the for the design work and some money to implement start implementation. 
So that's my concern. Uh, yes. Can I also make another point, Mr Chair? I think this section of this meeting today mm. is one of the poorest meetings I've attended at Council. And I think it's because of a number of reasons. Is One, there's not enough information in the report. And number two, more importantly, all everybody around the table knows that if you've got a lot of detailed questions that you should send them through to the chair or the officers before the meeting. And yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is this is like very little added value. If, if, if I could clarify this point of order first. So point of order acknowledged, thank you for, the, for that. Um, I think it's, um, uh, and it's not upheld. I think the misrepresentation may have been a, a, a wrong wording used by Deputy Mayor Helen, but thank you for clarifying together. Uh, clarification, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it, so, was, it, so was, for, it was updated. For point of clarification, the 1995, the Pukenoma Queen's part wasn't in the papers until it was tabled today. Co correct, and that's been the most contentious. So, so I wasn't able to prepare questions for it. Yes, and, and thank you for that. Hey, sure from now on, though, I, I would say when something is at, its, at the start, when we all vote for it to be put in, that we take the time during our five minute recess to read about it and ask any questions. Um, but, CE, would you like to? Yep, thank you. So um, through you, Chair, to, to answer the question that was asked, um, the, there are mechanisms available. The primary one would be if a contract is outside of both um, the approved budget and the delegations to the chief executive for unapproved expenditure, uh, unbudgeted expenditure, then it has to come back to council for a decision on revising the budget or, or a decision on how to proceed. Um, in addition to that, there's always um, uh, management's judgment. Just because something is within budget doesn't always necessarily mean it's right to proceed, and we can use our discretion to bring things back to council as well in, in those circumstances. Um, as I already outlined in my introduction, our understanding of the budget was we're going through a staged process. Council, previous terms of council have considered the reserve management plan that is directed for the, effectively, the landscaping design to become the new master plan for the garden. There's funding put aside to fund that piece of the process. Once you have a concept on, uh, developed, then future LTPs can consider long-term implementation budgets. Um, so we didn't see this as being outside of the budget that's approved in the long-term plan, which is why it's preceded and the work is underway. Thank you, Chief Executive David Langford. Um, for those on the Sports and Recreational Committee, um, there are external parties attending the meeting. So if you would, if you wanted to uh, be move on, then you, what's the word? Um, excuse early, then um, feel free to tell me. Thank you. Um, does that answer your questions, Helen? Yes. Thank you very much. Awesome. And 5.10 financial commitments that the Operations and Performance Committee received the report, financial commitments October 2022 to May 2023. Can I have a mover, please? Thank you, Councillor Charlotte. And seconded by Josh, Councillor Josh. Thank you very much. Is there any, um, yeah, hi, hey, Rob. Um, can I have Councillor Rob? Mm. Or? Thank you. Then Senior Officer. And then Senior Officer. Thank you. You know, one of the most important um, roles of councillors, as far as this council is concerned, is probity of this council on issues like this. You know, and when we are presented with something like this, and then there's comment about, well, you shouldn't be asking questions, you know, I, I get quite disappointed in that, because no matter how long it takes, we have invited this sort of questioning. We never used to have this sort of questioning when the, when the, the tenders board was in existence. And I know on things like the budget, Councillor Jenny was always very vigilant about making sure that whatever the item was, was properly budgeted for. I had different things like the value for money for the ratepayer and various things like that. Officers had the reports in front of them. 
So when there was questions about whether it's the highest, but why did you accept the highest tender, it was quickly answered because the officer said, well, that tenderer has not performed in this way or that way. And so there was a quick answer and it was done. And when that form came before this council, very rarely was there comment, very rarely was there um, uh, any discussion. So I just want to say to you councillors and through the chair that are getting a little bit tetchy about some of us asking quite a lot of questions, I would say if this is coming forward in this manner, please get used to it. Clarification. My question is this, is a number of councillors, I do value what's going on, I really do, but a number of councillors have another meeting at 1.30 which has passed. If we, if we leave now to attend that sports recreation committee meeting, will we still be quiet to continue? Well, who has to leave? The, there is a number of us. Including the chair. Uh. I won't be attending, but there is two external parties waiting. That's the reason why. Well, we won't record it. It won't be recorded, no. We won't record so we can go? No, you can't. We won't have a quorum. Okay. So we have to... St uh, I will stay. She's out there. Yeah. Um, I asked. She said it's because it's external parties. You can't delay it. I asked, but she said, because there's external party, she can't delay it. She's got guests, she's got visiting speakers. Right, okay. But this, this meeting does continue until we're finished, so... Um, um, Get on with it. Councillor Jenny. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, my, my comments are this. Look, this report's going to come to us regularly now, and I think there's not go there will be fewer questions, because there will be fewer items on the report. So that will be a benefit. But in fact, and we don't often agree, as you will know, but I do, I, I do agree with Rob that um, it is going to generate questions that normally wouldn't come into this room because we will have covered those. Also, when there's non-performance by a contractor, we don't talk about that in this room because that's not appropriate, but we can talk about that in the tenders board or through our communication. So there's some, some nuance in there that I think, you know, was, was kind of helpful, but that, that opportunity is now gone. Um, my, my concern on this one is I'm going to hone in on that one where we got the report at the last minute, which I specifically asked to have added because I knew it was missing. And I am concerned about it, and from, from two angles. One, a comment I made um, earlier in the week about when we discussed the... we discussed another project, the cost of that project has become extraordinarily large yeah, because we've mucked around and we haven't got on with it and we haven't made a decision to, to do something. And when we do that, every time we do that, we're going to be adding zeros down the track when we finally do it. And we've got to remember that. With this one, this Pukinamu Queen's Park has been floating around for about 22 years. At least 22 years. And the price has gone from 25000 to 425000 in that time for the plan, for the detailed plan. And I know that times have changed and the way we do things have changed, but if we'd acted then, one, we would have had the plan done and we would have had the work done and we probably would have had the work done for about $2 million. So, therefore, back to my second point, if I look at what's actually in the long-term plan, it has money spread over four years, 2021, 22 through to 24, 25, totaling $856,000. When reading that, when looking at the long-term plan, it is, it is acceptable to think that that includes um, design and capital works, not design. There's no way for us to know what is design and what is capital works in there, and we probably shouldn't need to. But when a figure jumps up as 500,000 budget, I think that's just an arbitrary, quite frankly, decision. Not, not well, maybe arbitrary is not quite the right word, um, but it's certainly a, a number plucked out of that $856,000 to say this is the plan. Um, and I'm uncomfortable with that. And if this, if this had come through the tenders board, I would have challenged it really strongly at that time. 
and this would have been back in October. So I am concerned about that. I mean, we have a figure in the budget of $856,000 spread over four years for Pokinama Queen's Park, which at the time was intended for much of the works. Now, even I would know that that's insufficient for the works, but that's the sum there. So we actually have a sum of 431000 left going into the 24-25 year, left of that 856 budgeted in the long-term plan, which is obviously enough to do a tiny little bit of work around the sergeant gallery before the opening. So I'm sort of expressing here a lot of detail, but I'm really unhappy about the whole process, and I would hope that we do things a lot more clearly in the future and that we don't muck around quite so much as well ourselves. So I think that there's culpability on our part as councillors, and we have longevity, those who come before us, and on, on officers for, for clarity. So that's, that's my view. I, I continue on with a degree of discomfort around this. And also, I think it's appropriate for us to ask the questions that we want and make the comments that we need. And if it causes discomfort around the room, so I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Thank you, Councillor Jenny. Um, Chief Executive David Anker is going to just um, give us an update on numbers. Uh, so through you, Chair, I just wanted to make a, a correction uh, or a clarification, possibly. The $24,000 figure that the um, councillor referred to was not, um, not the price for a complete design. Um, that figure refers only to council purchasing the intellectual property rights to a concept design that was done circa 20 years ago, and it was concept sketches only. Uh, we did have an offer um, from the same person that produced those to develop those through to a full design as per the specifications or very close to the specifications for this tender. That offered price was $300,000. Uh, and that was some time ago when that was offered to us. So if you adjust for inflation, you're again in a very similar ballpark range to the tendered prices that we've received through this process. So I thought it was just important to correct that so, because Thank we are in public uh, and I, I don't want our community to think that we paid $400,000 for something we could have bought for 24,000 because it's just not, not correct. Thank you, Steve Langford. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Helen Craig. Thank you. Um, yeah, my biggest concern is that that contract for Pukanami Queen's Park Landscape and Design is far beyond what I would have contemplated, and I think far beyond what our community would have contemplated for a design and not implementation. We are a tiny, tiny council, and I think uh, worries me that council would enter into a contract for that amount without double checking expectation and dollars are just going out the door and it's a huge amount of money my gosh if I had 425,000 for town centre regeneration implementation I'd be thrilled it's a huge amount of money that it comes straight out of the ratepayers pocket and I want to see the chief executive exercise through his staff a lens over what we are doing. That's in terms of what is value for money and just coming back sometimes we say, hey guys, did you actually realise that this was going to cost this amount of money? Uh, is this still what you want to do? Um, I, 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 I mean, I am gobsmacked at what this is costing. I really, really am, and I don't say that very often around this table. And I am worried. I would like to see some formal mechanism or something come back from the chief executive at some stage on how just a mechanism to come back to this table. Otherwise, we're going to have to become very precise when we set budgets that, you know, this is the maximum amount we want spent around, say, a design or whatever, uh, something like that. Because, if, you know, and I don't want to have to get that prescriptive because that will make our lives very hard. But that is my request, that a deep breath is taken 
and uh, you can come back to the table and ask us, is this still what you were contemplating? I never want to see this type of contract again. I'm sorry, I, it's just, don't, I don't care who does the contract, it's a massive amount of money and I never contemplated it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kate. Um, I just want to clarify what I said before about a value-added process. Number one, if you think this is probity, think again, because it's not. Like, there's no way I would expect that, that we have demonstrated probity from the conversation that, that has just happened over the last hour. Number two, and I'll say it again, this was not a denial of council, my comment was not a denial of councillors being able to ask for questions, it was to remind them that the long-standing process at this council, and indeed good governance, is that if you've got a raft of detailed questions, then ask them ahead of the meeting, instead of turning up and hoping to count, catch council, uh, officers out, because it's not good enough. Thank you. That's the end of um, Councillor Peter. I would just like to reiterate what Kate said. You know, I've been sitting here for the last hour and I, or more, and I thought these should have been questions that are asked prior to this meeting, and it would have sped the whole thing up, and we all would have wasted less time. We have guests here that have still to report that have been here all day and I have sympathy for them. You know, so please take note of what Kate said and if we have detailed questions, let's make them before we come to the meeting, please. Thank you, Councillor Peter. Um, whew, all in favour? All against? Carried. Um, due to the liberty of questions, uh, is there any further motions that someone wants to raise? No? So, uh, thank you. We are on to our last item. Um, 5.11 Capital Project Status Report Update April 2023. Uh, I have General Manager of Community Property and Places, Sarah Hagen, to present the key project updates, including the velodrome, curbside recycling, streets for people. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, can I just, before Gay talks um, to her report, just cover off um, a couple of matters. We've got the regular status reports in the agenda. Um, one of them is from the Streets for People project. Uh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, the passing of Denise, um, our project manager, a couple of weeks ago. Um, as a result of um, that, we're working with the team in Waka Kotahi at the moment. It's a 90% um, Waka Kotahi funded project. Um, working through the next steps, Waka Kotahi have supported um, and are committed to supporting us through the next phase. Um, generally, uh, we're at the we're reaching the the end of the initial design phase of that um, project and gathering up some details now to inform the delivery phase. That's a general statement. There's, that's not quite right specifically. Um, uh, so we're sort of at a at a junction in the in the delivery of the project overall. Key st uh, stakeholders have been uh, made aware of the situation that that we find ourselves in. Uh, and some comms has been prepared to go out to the wider um, uh, group of people that have attended all of the workshops that have been conducted during this year um, to let them know that, that we are um, almost in a pause while we um, regather and recruit um, and, and move forward. Um, so, so I just wanted to um, put that, that out there um, before we kicked off. Um, I, I think... Uh, if you don't mind, um, Mr Chair, if we can move to Gay's um, update, which is a deeper um, uh, report on the Sergeant redevelopment project um, as requested through this committee. Um, so it's a, it's a, um, a regular deep dive, um, the first under our new reporting structure. Um, it's not 
front of our agenda, though, is it? That's right at the back. Hold in there. Yes, you may. Thank you. Michael, can you turn the... Sorry, you guys normally have Trump's <laughs> cards. All right, so as requested, I've provided an addition to the status update, the, the, the table there, um, construction update with images. I hope that's been helpful. And just to briefly say, in terms of delivery against program, which is the uh, principal issue there with the report, uh, stability issues are still driving variations in our existing building, which is uh, the critical path works around the central dome and north wing, so we're well behind program. And we've now got the project team and contractor focusing on a construction program end date of March 2024. And costs have now been updated accordingly and the midpoint has been adjusted. Um, so we're now sitting at a $68 million midpoint. Um, in terms of the new wing, we are still looking at a completion estimation date there or plan date of December. Um, and... We are also reviewing post-construction activities with the gallery team to inform the opening date, um, which is being scheduled for next year. So construction end is one thing, but what happens post-construction is the other thing that will impact an actual opening date. Uh, and finally to say that we've had good uh, interest in uh, a cafe for cafe expression of interest for an operator. Local operators have received that very well and we were given them an opportunity to view the site and ask questions. And even for those that didn't um, submit an expression, they, their general comments are that the cafe will further enrich the local hospitality scene. So that's a very positive um, outcome there and we will be looking to uh, proceed with uh, engagement of a potential operator in due course. So I'll just over to questions now. Thank you for that and we go to questions. Councillor Josh and clarifications. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Gay. My question's just around the, um, it's on page 128 under risks. So um, it talks about the delay being around recovery and engagement of alternative suppliers, but it doesn't actually say that that's been confirmed. So can you confirm that, that subcontractors to replace the ones that went into liquidation have been confirmed? And through you, Chair. Yes, I can confirm that. So it's been a, quite a smooth transition. We now have a local operator um, who's doing the steel work, and we have um, the actual incumbent uh, that went into liquidation. Uh, the con main contractor has taken those on directly okay. to deliver the project. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Kate. Thank you. Just a matter of um, thanks for the report, Gay. Um, just a matter of clarification, on page 129 of our papers, you talked about um, a review of the mid-range total project cost, resulting in an increase of 715000 Is that included in the $68 million? Yep. Through your tree, yes it is. Thank yes. You. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> nice and quick. <laughs> we'll see... Um, and then um, curbside recycling. Welcome, Rosemary. Oh, you've got to drive me. Hello. <laughs> The report's pretty straightforward. Work's underway up at the Velodrome now. We're in the fourth week of the work, um, and it's progressing well. So happy to take any questions if there are any further chair. Questions on the Velodrome track replacement? Councillor Beda. I'll be quick. The um, contract, was it a fixed price or a... Yes. It was, cool. Cool. Thank you very much. Trish for curbside recycling. Hello, Trish. 
here an afternoon everybody um just a quick update there's a couple of changes since i last did well since i did the report so our curbside trial that we were wanting to have up and running by the first of august is now going to be delayed by approximately six weeks through to mid-september uh, and that's because the bins that we have ordered uh, have been delayed coming into the country so they won't be in Whanganui till about the 5th of September and then by the time we labour them and put our information on them and get them delivered it won't, won't be till mid-September but that, that takes us through to about the 15th of December so it still gives us enough time to gather the information that we need. And if worse comes to worse and there's further delay then we'll have to shorten our, um, our trial but we still think we'll be able to get enough information from a shortened trial if that is the case. Uh, the second point that I've got on there is that we're looking at undertaking a full waste assessment to give us a baseline ahead of um, the curbside recy recycling service being implemented. We'll probably look at doing that next year. Uh, we thought we might be able to get some funding through our Ministry for Environment for that, but it's not. They're not looking at doing that. They're looking at um, contamination within uh, crates, so there is no funding for that. So we'll look at doing that uh, next year ahead of the introduction of service whenever that goes ahead. Thank you, Trish. Open questions? No questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. <laughs> Easy. And the streets for people you, you do yourself? I wasn't planning on giving any more of an update, um, given okay. that we're in the position that we're in. Yeah. No worries. Does anyone have any questions in Street Fuel, though, at all? Just to make sure we've dotted the I's across the T's. Thank you. Um, I thought we were on the last one, and I apologize. Yeah. There's 5.12, which is, uh, I thought actually wasn't ours, but the yeah. it, it is pulled from the agenda. Right. We are done. So this, um, sorry? Oh, apologies. Yeah, that's, that helps, isn't it? Uh, 5.11, Kate? Um, or Mr. Chair, I should say. I just wonder, um, just you did ask at the end of the item about the, um, the, contract, the, the contracts that were um, before us. I just wonder if... Um, if we might have a, a report next month that outlines the situation for all of those contracts and answers all of those questions um, for our next report, actually. I think we need to have it on record. I think it's a great idea, mostly because we have, I have about 15 actions just on that one area, so. It'll never be that long again. I don't feel in it. Yes, I, I get that. It was a perfect storm. Um, I get that, but I just think if, I don't think we need a recommendation. But I just thought it would be worth putting on the next agenda. Thank you for that. That the operations and performance committee received the report, capital project status report update, April two thousand twenty-three. Thank you, Councillor Josh. Seconded. Thank you, Councillor Peter. Uh, all in favour? Aye. All against? Carried. Thank you. Um, this have a karakia, which will be led by Jenny. Councillor Jenny, thank you. Thank you. E oha ki ringa, ronga ki a ranga nui. E oha ki raro ki a papatuanuku. Whakatairanga, te kupu, te korero, te mahi, ki te pō o te wari, he tuanga, he mahi amuri, ka puta ki te wai au, ki te au marama, homie, huie, tai ki e. I acknowledge, greet these things above the sky, universe and the heavens. I acknowledge, greet these things below the earth in all its entirety. Let us suspend the words, the discussion, debate, negotiations, the work covered to the pillar of the house as a treasure, point of importance to be revisited at a later time so that we may enter into enlightenment. Let it be bound and fixed. Yes, fixed. Let it be agreed by all. <laughs> 